There he is. There he is. Hey, Daniel. Hi there. Sorry, I had some technical difficulties finding the link. No worries. Uh, did you get a chance to get sworn in? I did. Um, the workaround was that I signed the paper remotely, and then uh, later this week I'll go in person. So I'm good to I'm good okay. to make a vote. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. This is the whatever day it is, February 22nd, 2022 meeting of the City of Ithaca Planning and Development Board. Uh, it'll be a fairly long night. We're scheduled to end before 9.30, um, but we have a couple complicated projects. We have a lot of public comment and we've got some decisions before us that are gonna take a little bit of time. I don't expect us to make our, uh, our estimated time. I expect us to be late. Um, and with that, I'll ask you know any applicants or members of the public who are watching along and plan to participate in our public hearings or present before the board to just be mindful uh, of time and making sure that whatever you're sharing with us is something that we need to hear and haven't heard maybe immediately before. Um, and that's very helpful. Uh, so I, we do appreciate that. Uh, I'll also say that the public hearing tonight for Outen, for which we have you know a number of folks wishing to speak, will likely not happen before 7.50, 8 o'clock. So if you're in the waiting room now, looking to speak now, um, you won't be able to, because uh, that doesn't come till later. Uh, there will be a privilege of the floor at the beginning of the meeting, but that is for projects that don't have a public hearing. Um, so there will be a few folks from the public speaking uh, potentially at that time, but it won't be about the pop, those, those projects that have a public hearing. Um, with that, I believe we're ready to, to start the menu, uh, not the menu, start the meeting, um, and we'll begin with introductions. Lisa, could you kick us off? Sure. I'm Lisa Nicholas. I'm the Acting Director of Planning and Development and staff to the board. Anya? Sorry about that. I was muted. Anya Harris, City of Ithaca staff. Nikki? Nikki Sarah, Environmental and Landscape Planner and staff to the board. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Godden, uh, member of the board. Emily. Member of the board. Mitch. Mitch Glass, member of the board. Garrick. Garrick Black, member of the board and liaison to the Board of Public Works. Daniel. Daniel Correa, member of the board. And I'm Rob Lewis, I'm your chair. Um, first item on the agenda is agenda review. Have there been any changes to the agenda? Not that I'm aware of, Matt. Nikki, any changes? Nope, I'm aware. Great. Uh, next up is approval of minutes. Before us, we have November 23rd and December 21st. Uh, only, is, only November. Sorry. Only November. Lies and deceit. Uh, <laughs> only November. Are there any comments on the November minutes? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve November minutes? I see Emily so move. Is there a second? I need a second. Elizabeth, all those in favor of approving November minutes, please raise your hand or otherwise indicate acceptance. And that's everyone but Daniel. Daniel, are you uh, abstaining or maybe just screen frozen? He froze, yeah. It looks frozen. Ah, that happens. Okay, that's fine. Um, still passes arguably unanimously. <clears throat> and that brings us to public comment. Uh, that is the privilege of the floor I mentioned earlier. Lisa, are there any members of the public wishing to speak before the board or are there comments that need to be read into the record? There are comments that should be read into the record. And Anya? Uh, I think the iPad 5 is um, Edward Rice and he is... Uh, Actually, it's not. We let him in already yeah, and it's well, somebody he, else. Yeah. No, no. He said it's Edward Rice. He just emailed me. And he, I think, wants to speak. Um, he's a neighbor to the Chabad house. So I think that's what he was indicating. OK, um, we'll try that again. Sorry, shall I, shall I let him in? I'll let him in. But before it was Dan, it was uh, David Reedman, the same oh. person. Yeah. Oh. So. Well, let's see who we've got in here. No, okay. you're, you're right. <laughs> Okay, I'll email him back and let him know that he can 
Um, I'll, I'll get in contact with him. Sorry about that. So, there are co comments to be read into the record and um, Nikki was going to do that. David, I'm sorry we let you in again. We thought you were somebody else. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll try and tonight. get somebody down. Next, next time you come in, you're here. To you, you're, you'll be on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we also have another person in here. Noah Demarest, who's not public, but oh. okay. Um, so I have three to read into the record. The first one is about concerning Catherine Commons, and it says, members of the planning board, after seeing the way the previous demolition occurred with both sidewalks shut off to pedestrians on Catherine Street, we need the developer to ensure safe, convenient passage of pedestrians by keeping a sidewalk open on Catherine Street and Cook 24-7. Aside from flagging vehicles, equipment in and out, momentary closure, and keep a walkway open on College Avenue for most or all of the construction, even if it means using Jersey barriers, occupying curbside public space, minimize the impact on pedestrian mobility throughout demolition and construction. I'm hopeful that Ithaca will respect the safety needs of pedestrians. We are not second-class commuters, avoiding future occurrences such as the closure of dual sidewalks or long-term closure of any sidewalk. And that's from Daniel Keogh. And then the next one to be read into record is concerning Chabad Center, and it is from Crowd. Dear planning board members, Crowd circular, circular, Circulatory Reuse Zero Waste Development is a collaborative partnership that works in Ithaca, Tompkins County, and around the state to encourage more sustainable treatment of our built environment, including advocating for deconstruction rather than demolition of buildings and infrastructure. Crowd understands the house at 107 Lake Street, former home of William Strunk, author of The Elements of Style, will be removed in order to accommodate the expansion of the Chabad Center. Crowd partners strongly support the house be relocated to another site if possible. If that is not possible, we urge the owner and architect to consider allowing salvage and deconstruction of the house rather than demolition. Crowd partners are available to work directly with relevant parties to arrange for this, similar to a recent crowd deconstruction project on College Avenue at the site of the future Catherine Commons development. Construction and demolition debris in, is our country's largest waste stream, generated at more than 600 million tons annually. That amount is nearly double our municipal solid waste, electronic waste, and textile waste combined. Deconstruction offers the opportunity to reuse and recycle building materials, thereby diverting them from our landfills. It offers economic, economic benefits through workforce development and the supply of quality rare building materials. It is also a way to recognize and honor the cultural significance of the original building and its materials and craftsmanship. We hope the relocation or deconstruction of 107 Lake Street can be incorporated into the project approval process, thereby supporting the Ithaca's commitment to sustainability and the Green New Deal. Thank you for con your consideration. Please reach out to any of the below crowd partners for more information. Sincerely, Cornell University Research Labs, the Circular Construction Lab, and Just Places Lab, Finger Lakes Reuse, Historic Ithaca, Preservation Association of Central New York, and Susan Christopherson, Center for Community Planning, and others. And then the third and last comment um, is for a variance at 304 Utica Street. And it reads, Dear board members, Mary Shelley and I own property at 104 slash 106 East Yates Street. And our property is adjacent to 304 Utica Street. On Thursday, November 18th, or sorry, February 18th, 2022, we received a notice of appeal regarding a zoning ordinance and a letter with plans from architect Emily and Petrina for Amy Ty and Nick Klein's proposed two-story expansion to the back of their house. The letter lets us know that their proposal will come before the board this Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022, and that they are looking for a size waiver. Receiving information about their zoning appeal barely gave us enough time to respond considering the weekend of the holiday. We are objecting to the size waiver and are concerned about the addition. This is a huge addition that looks as though it equals two thirds of the original footprint. What the architect calls bay windows are actually a cantilevered section of the addition. We are objecting to the waiver because it will not only impact our property, but it'll also affect our two neighbors on East Yate Street. The tie and Klein backyard appears on the new draft flood hazard zone. Check the following link. They give the link to the new FEMA maps. 
you can see the, that part of our property and part of the Haynes Sharp property is in the flood hazard zone. Already during the rain or snow melts, our basement floods and there is continuous full stream of water. The groundwater inflow goes on until there's an extended dry period. We have a sump pump and a dehumidifier that runs continuously when this happens. If the pump fails, and it has in the past, the basement has flooded up to one foot before we could fix the pump. My guess is it could have risen higher if we had not caught it while it was still raining. Ground surface is an important factor in absorbing water runoff and rainfall. If you notice on the map that the Heinz Sharp property practically, practically no ground surface around their house, so they have no ground surface to absorb water. That leaves a portion of our yard and most all the Thai Klein backyard to absorb any flood or rainwater. Occupying half of the Thai Klein yard with an addition would put a considerable burden of water absorption water on our property. That would make matters worse for our basement. It also could cause a considerable problem for my foundation as well as Haynes Sharps. You'll notice that the four houses on the corner northeast of East Yates and Utica are packed together. Even though the Thai Klein's proposed addition leaves a minimum distance from that to the property line, it creates an even denser area. I'd also like to address that the architect is on the planning board. While I'll assume that they will recuse themselves, just their presence, whether they are at the meeting to address this variance or not is a concern to us. I hope that the board has an open and fair mind to the concerns of a neighbor. Thank you for your attention. Sincerely, Mary Shelley and Barbara Anger, owners of 106 East Jade Street. 106 and 104 East Street Street. And those are the three comments. Thank you very much. Um, the one comment with a million signers, did that includes Susan Christofferson as one of the signers, or did I mishear that? Susan Christofferson Center. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, yeah, that was the crowd letter. Crowd got letter. it. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, are there members of the public who have signed up to speak during the public comment period? I just checked in with the guy who spoke to me earlier by email, and he's actually okay with just watching on YouTube. So, okay. Uh, and is that would that be it for this particular part? Okay. Uh, we don't need to move to adjourn that, so we'll just move on to board response to public comment. Is there any member of the board wishing to respond to anything that was said? Seeing none, uh, we'll start with special permits. First up is the special permit for a neighborhood commercial use for a music studio in the R2B district. Hello. Hello. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, uh, I'm Noah Demarest, um, architect representing the owners uh, for this project at 105 Wood Street. And assuming you can see my screen, this is showing the context map for the project, uh, which is located here at 105. It is a garage uh, and music studio on the second floor, which replaces what was previously a garage in a similar location. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of at the end of Wood Street as it bends around and becomes Geneva Street. And it sits relatively low compared to West Spencer Street, which is up high with a retaining wall that runs along the back property of 105. Um, the, the owners of this property also own 107. So they, are, they occupy 107 and they rent out 105. Uh, and then they have a home-based music lesson um, business uh, that is going to relocate from their house into this standalone garage structure with the music studio on the second floor. Um, I'm just going to show you an updated site plan. Well, actually, before I do that, this is a photo of the garage that used to be there. It's no longer there. It, it was taken down uh, a few years ago. And this is a tree that's actually within the city right of way, which is my understanding is it's actually gone at this point. It was marked for removal by the city and has since been removed. Um, so there is, it's hard to see, but there is, there is a curb cut here that actually serves that garage that, that is in that location. Um, and then I do wanna just show quickly the, the building design 
uh, sort of preliminary building design shows the garage, the front of the garage, two cars, and then the second floor studio space with a side exterior stair access, uh, which you can see from this side, this side faces the existing house at 105. Uh, and there's parking, existing parking there as well. So let me show you the site plan. This is an updated site plan, which I believe was submitted. I think everybody probably got it. Um, it kind of came in late last week. Um, after some discussion with Tim Logue and, um, and staff at PRC and so forth, uh, there's, there was some discussion about whether or not we could keep the curb cut and how, how, to, how to deal with that. And it was agreed that what we would do is um, relocate the curb cut slightly to align it with, this, with the new structure um, and shorten it a little bit. Uh, the existing asphalt drive would remain. And the driveway that is remaining is actually the driveway that would serve guests and, and students as they arrive whereas the garage structure would serve the residents of the house itself. So they would be parked permanently in the garage, but people coming and going would use this existing driveway. Um, there was also some discussion at PRC about the positioning of the house or the garage, I'm sorry, how, how close it is to the front property line. It, it's actually sitting at five feet, which is a little bit further away than, than the previous garage. Um, but it does stick out a little bit beyond the existing house. And we recognize that that's not an ideal situation. However, it, in conversations with Tim Logue, the desire is to move it as far away from the retaining wall at Spencer Street as possible because the city, uh, although they don't have an easement to maintain access back here, it is in, I think, everybody's best interest to kind of keep it as far away from that retaining wall should there ever work need to be done on that but also to keep it away from the steep grade and the back. So the idea is just to move it forward. Um, we feel it's, it's not ideal, but at the same time, it has very little impact on anybody given that it's the last structure on the street. And also that Wood Street bends around South and becomes South Geneva Street. Uh, so it feels like the houses are just sort of stepping around the corner, if you will. Uh, we, so we're here for the special use permit, but we're also uh, seeking a variance, which is only variances are only for the pre-existing conditions of the house. Uh, the garage as proposed does meet all the requirements for setback and lot coverage and so forth. So there's not a variance for that portion. It's just for the existing conditions. Uh, and with that, I think I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not sure if I covered everything or not, but I can. Uh Given what we heard at PRC, it sounds like you covered everything. Uh, before we jump into questions, I'm going to go ahead and ask that we declare ourselves lead agents. Uh, is there a motion from any member of the board wishing to declare lead agency for this project? I see Elizabeth move. Is there a second? I see Emily move. All in favor of declaring ourselves lead agent, please raise your hand. Daniel and Garrick. Nice. Great, so that is unanimous. Um, with that, are there any questions about the project, questions or comments? This is a relatively simple one. Um, before we move on to the next resolution, um, I just wanted to say we did look at this reasonably closely for P at PRC and got mostly positive uh, reaction and it sounds like the questions that we did have were followed up with with the city engineer uh, about that curb cut and the placement of the garage and seemed to be addressed. Uh, so I'm feeling pretty comfortable with this. I'll just go around the room and get a get a sense of comfort. Emily. Yeah, I'm comfortable. I have no further questions. Mitch. Great to see this use uh, music studio next to a house. I really like the idea. And thanks for fixing up the property. Great job, I think this is fine. Elizabeth. I agree, I'm glad to see this kind of development um, in a residential neighborhood. Just out of curiosity, Noah, do you plan on like having enhanced SDC ratings in the wall? 
Uh, that's a good question. Uh, not necessarily uh, enhanced STC ratings. However, just the insulation factor of you know being exterior walls, I think they will exceed or uh, perform really well. Um, and as uh, I just recognize that Russ, who's the owner and um, is on the call as well, I didn't see him before, but um, he could probably speak a little bit to the nature of the existing use um, in their house. And I think he had mentioned, you know, in the summertime when it's sort of unbearably hot, windows are open, music is playing. Um, so the, the real benefit to this is that in a conditioned space, the ability to, you know, um, keep the windows closed. <laughs> during this kind of music, uh, music lessons will be a huge benefit compared to the current situation. Okay, okay. I just figured since it's new construction, it's a good um, opportunity for the owner to get some enhanced ratings for his own, you know, yeah. benefit. But yeah, great project, thanks. Daniel. I agree with Mitch. Uh, it's a pretty great project, very straightforward. Um, and uh, yeah. Eric. I agree with others. Very succinct. Uh, like that. Next up, we have a potential neg deck on this project. Um, because we are moving fairly fast, I want to check in with Lisa about our obligations here before I look for a motion on this resolution. This, to me, you know, looks like a very simple project with no obvious environmental impacts. What do we need to go through before we move this resolution just to make sure we've done everything properly? Well, it is an unlisted action, so it's a short form. Um, so parts one and two have been provided to you. Um, and we didn't prepare part three. Great. Do you have anything uh, to add, Nikki? All right, I don't think well, so, yeah. That sounds Wait. fine and straightforward. Um, is there a motion for the negative declaration on seeker, which is the green resolution in your packet? I see Emily move. I saw Elizabeth second. Uh, and I should be doing roll call votes for these resolutions rather than, than hand votes. So that we'll would do be that great. This time. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Um, so we'll do that this time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move straight into that vote. Uh, Emily, could I start with you? Um, I vote yes. Mitch. I vote. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Eric. Yes. I also vote yes. So that is unanimous. Next up is the blue resolution approval of special permit for this project. Is there a motion from any member of the board for that resolution? Uh, 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 oh, oh, oh. No, it's just a formality, but I think we're supposed to have a public hearing. Oh, oh am I wrong? do we have a public hearing on this? Good catch, um, Anya. Good catch, Anya. Thank you. Is there a motion to open public hearing? Elizabeth, is there a second for that public hearing? Emily, all those in favor of opening public hearing? All right. Uh, Lisa and or Nikki, is there any member of the public who is looking to speak, or Anya for that matter? No one signed right. up. No one signed up. Is there a motion to close public hearing? I see Elizabeth move, Emily second. All those in favor of closing public hearing. Very good, glad that that was caught on you. Thank you very, very much. Um, now, I'm gonna look for a motion on this blue resolution, which is approval of special permit. I see Elizabeth move this time. Uh, so I need a second, Emily second. Uh, and this we can go around the, or we'll do, we'll do roll call. Emily, uh, I'll start with you. Vote yes. Mitch. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Eric. Yes. And I also vote yes, making that unanimous. So that should be it for this project. It was a lot of a lot of actions for you know something relatively straightforward, but I'm glad we were able to get it done in one meeting. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Next up, we have site plan review for 101 Pier Road. Are you letting people in?
Hello, everyone. Hello. So I have Jacob, David Reedman, Scott, Kate, anybody else? David Herrick and Jody Edger, if you see their names. I did see Jody um, Edger. Also, Steve Hugo from Holt Architects. I don't see them. It's possible any of them are joining by phone. Steve Hugo's here. Mm, it's possible. Uh, we're sending them a message now that we're on. Um, but the uh, most of us are here, so we could get started. Sure. Take it away. All right, so uh, quick introductions. I'm Kate Chesbro here from Whittem Planning and Design. You've met our team a number of times, but uh, from WPD, you have myself, Scott Whittem, and Jacob Von Mecco. Uh, I'll just introduce everyone. From the ownership team, we have uh, David Reedman here, uh, Civil Engineering, uh, T.G. Miller. Uh, we have uh, David Herrick, Holt Architects, Steve Hugo, and if Jody Edger joins, he's part of the ownership team as well. Um, so we're continuing our review of the updates to, sharing the wrong screen, that was my calendar. Um, continuing our review of updates to the, are you seeing the site plan? Yes. Yes. Great, sorry. A review of updates to this City Harbor project. So um, Jody did just uh, message us that he's having some issues getting on. So you might see him trying to enter in some way. But um, just wanted to share uh, the current site plan. This is being very uh, small modifications are being made as we go. But um, what we have done to date is really focus on the city harbor updates. And we just wanted to remind all of us as we review this, that this has always been conceived as one site plan with the Guthrie Medical Office building and one whole site. Um, and that may have been lost in, in some past conversations. Uh, so we wanted to kind of remind ourselves of that as well. And, uh, to follow on some recent conversations about the public spaces that are being uh, added to the site as a result of this development. There are some that are already in place as that were uh, built as part of Guthrie. So there are improvements to the waterfront, Hugo waterfront trail, uh, picnic tables and swing benches that add a really nice pop of color, especially now in the winter. There's this large green open space. And then as we talked about in 2020, but again, is a little bit of a refresher, this pr waterfront promenade is 1700 linear feet that will be publicly accessible for pedestrians and become this big spur to the Kyoga waterfront trail. So that has always been a real central part of this. It's an organizing feature as well that the buildings and public space are on the waterfront and things like parking are behind and um, are designed with best practices as well. So this uh, new waterfront promenade links the series of public open spaces. Things in blue were kind of previously approved, um, you know, and yellow spaces as we showed in our original January submission, some of the updates that are being made as a result of the ground floor changes are increasing the amount of publicly open space uh, on the site. So just a quick uh, holistic view of that. As we said, we're continuing to update the site plans and we're thinking that during subsequent meetings, we'll be able to show even further detail, but uh, this is a minor update. But as we look at the marina services that will be part of the Point West building, there's now a pretty generous uh, space for people coming and going there. There are uh, bathrooms and showers for boaters and um, ramp and stair access to that space as well. 
the finished floor has always been above the promenade, but uh, as part of the site design, we're making uh, the best use of that vertical difference by having public seating, landscaping, these kind of really generous staircases as part of that. Um, so a little reminder of that. Uh, um, one one uh, uh, note on that uh, also, uh, the finished floor elevation has, has increased. Yep, we've added a foot to the finished floor. Um, so it's now, I believe it's four feet above the promenade, whereas it had been three. And again, in March, we'll be able to dive into some of those details, but um, some of the things we submitted in January uh, show the vertical relationships. And again, we can revisit these if you'd like to, but we on the whole feel that the design changes that are being made in the current plans are an improvement in terms of public space. Uh, and they are making good use of that vertical difference. We submitted these renderings of the public space outside of the Point West building during the PRC. And um, it was mentioned then that, uh, you know, this, this team, you know, hoping that we are really committed to the high quality materials that are shown in renderings. And, you know, renderings aren't reality, but at the same time we are, uh, you know, as has been shown during previous design review and all of that, the quality of materials being considered for this project are very high, you know, real stone, a variety of textures and seasonal interest for plantings. We have these really unique um, seating opportunities uh, that you can lean over and look at the water, movable tables and chairs for the cafe space, having the buffer of plantings behind you to be able to look at the waterfront. So we think this is going to be a really comfortable space for people, uh, members of the public, throughout the year to come and look at Cascadilla Creek and the inlet. It's a great view from this point. Um, and we're paying special attention to the design of those spaces. Um, so we uh, also wanted to share uh, some, of, some of the nitty gritty as it relates to parking. So uh, this, this site plan is this, the same version as we showed a, at the first slide, but has the ground floor program of parking shown. But again, as a refresher, this is the August 2020 shared parking diagram. And this was part of the approved traffic impact study and agreement with Guthrie and the city for how to share the many uses for the golf course, for the waterfront, for the medical office building, for people coming to what was then a restaurant and is now a cafe and for residents. And so the, the original demand was really high and we were able to bring that down to these numbers by doing shared parking, as well as having a, a two new TCAT bus stops. There's one on the city harbor and one at Guthrie. There will be a lot of bike parking and we're in conversation with CarShare now to cite that. That was uh, talked about in 2020, but just as a reminder that we are thinking uh, not only of transit and uh, uh, having a personal vehicle, but also of biking and walking to the site. So the overall uh, ways that parking is being shared from what was approved in 2020 and comparing that to what we have now, the way that the allocations are shown is the same, but we've added a full new building. As, as we know, there's now an uh, previously, this was just a footprint for a future building, um, and this was, you know, kind of temporarily going to be surface parking near the waterfront. Some of it was land banked as well, but now we have a whole new building, which adds more units, of course, but the parking ratio as approved is one-to-one -one residential unit to residential parking space, so this plan meets that and still has public parking for the waterfront shown as well as golfers. We received a public comment just before the meeting about um, where's the public supposed to park to go to the uh, promenade and 
uh, as part of the shared agreement, we have addressed that. So um, again, this is a little bit of a refresher. We can come back to these as we, uh, as we go. But one other development since making our submission earlier this month is that the City Harbor team has re-engaged SRF associates who did the original traffic study. And they're currently working on looking at the parking utilization and the trip generation impacts of the current project, considering Point East 2, considering the cafe, um, those are the two programmatic changes. So we feel quite confident and we'll be able to confirm this in our next meetings, but that the trip generation, um, especially around peak hour is going to remain uh, unaffected and that the parking utilization that's shown in these plans with the ratios that were approved and by making surface parking, podium parking, especially at the point east too, um, that there's not additional demand for parking, but we'll be able to confirm all of that as SRF continues their study. Um, uh, this is just a copy of what was in your packet for our current parking allocation. Uh, and uh, one thing that has changed since our submission is we've taken away, uh, remind me, is it eight surface parking spaces on the street? Uh, yes. That allows for emergency vehicle access to the Point East 2 building. So the numbers um, have changed. Now there's a total of 441 parking spaces total. So we'll provide this update as a formal update, but wanted to share that they have been removed. That was, a, that was a result of a meeting with Tom Parsons about yep. um, aerial access to, to the north facade of that building. Yep. And uh, those were some site updates. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any other questions about the site, but might hand it over now to Steve to talk about some of the building updates that are in progress. Thanks, Kate. Um, la last meeting, we had shared some elevation details and some renderings. And along the way, um, some of the members said it'd be nice to see some other of the, the renderings that we had, had previously produced updated. And I, I'll, I'll stress as I did at the last meeting that you know, these renderings take a lot of time and so they might trickle out over meetings as we, as we develop the, design, the redesign of Point East and Point West and the design of Point East. Um, so we have one, one new rendering today to share with you and the one that we shared at last meeting, I'll, I'll share with you again. So uh, we previously did not look at the north side of the building. So this is the drop off on the north side of Point West. This is the rendering that you saw in the previously approved project. Um, you'll note the port cocher, the covered, the covered drop-off area, the storefront entrance into the main lobby. And to the right of that was uh, additional storefront that was looking into the restaurant. And on to the left of that entrance was essentially utilitarian entrances into um, into support spaces. The next rendering, Kate, um, I think we wanted to stress that in general, this building is gonna, is gonna look like the building that you saw before. We, we are not anticipating any great architectural change. We are, there is some shifting of some of the units on the upper floors, um, very slight, that, that is happening, but for the most part, you're not going to recognize that the building is going to look like the building that you'd seen before. But most notably, the the change on this on this elevation is where we previously had the entrance into the restaurant. There will be an entrance into our underbuilding parking, and to the right of that entrance, a, a storefront entrance into a, a secondary elevator lobby, and to the left of that. We're proposing window boxes that um, that would, you know, essentially be places for marketing or branding material. It could be for the cafe. It could be for the um, the housing itself. But those would be basically like display windows. And 
Um, and then we also have a leasing office that would happen in this elevation to the left of that main entrance would be a leasing office where when a potential um, tenant is going to come in, the leasing office can see that person and and address you know any any um, potential newcomers. Uh, next slide, please. You saw this elevation last meeting. I'll I'll just reiterate what the most notable change on this was the Point East building where we had um, apartments on the ground floor. We now are, we now have parking. The, the good news is as where so many developments you know have open parking, it's the most inexpensive way to do under building parking. You don't have to pay for ventilation. You don't have to pay for the facade. We are proposing enclosed parking where we're, we're um, concealing the, the on-ground, on-grade parking in a stone facade. And, and also that would be a mechanically ventilated space. So there is, there is some cost to the project to achieve that. But what, what, you know, what, one of the things that I wanted to stress here, we understand some of the comments about animating the ground floor. And there were some comments about, well, you know, it was nice to have those windows there. Um, I understand that point. I guess I would just want to make a bit of a counterpoint, which is that as an architect, we struggle a lot sometimes when we put apartments on sidewalks and in really public spaces. And there ends up being the separation of public and private that is not insurmountable, but a challenge. So what I would like to point out here, and Kate's site plan supports it, is that in the previous design, the, there was basically the 10 or 15 foot promenade and then a retaining wall and then a raised area that was private. Those were private patios. They probably, you know, they ultimately would have had some landscaping that makes them feel more private to separate them from the promenade. In this current design, the, you know, the trade-off here is that we don't have those apartments there, but we've extended the public realm all the way up to the building facade. So there are stairs that are gonna invite people to come up and where you see the wood paneling on the ground floor are places where there's benches up against the building. And you know, we see in, our, in the form of animation here, the ability for boaters or passer buyers or people from the cafe to, to come up and be on that raised area looking out over the water. And um, anyway, that's, uh, you saw this elevation before, but I did wanna follow up on that point. Uh, next slide, Kate. You also saw this elevation previously, the, but it was in this, this latest package. This is the first massing um, looking at the Point East 2 building, the, the, the building that you haven't seen yet. That building is currently being designed. We hope in the next, you know, next month or the month after uh, that you'll be looking at revised elevations. The point we wanted to make is it's about, you know, it's similar in height. It's gonna be similar in architectural style. What the one thing that we do anticipate is the zoning has changed. We no longer have the required step backs on the upper floors. And we think that's gonna be really a, sort of a nice variation in the difference between point west, point east and point east two. And what I mean by that, when you look at our renderings, um, if you look at the slight, differenti the slight difference between point west and point east, the, the way they meet the sky is very, is very different because of the step backs. And, you know, we think that's really great that the building isn't this monotonous, you know, treatment of the same bay over and over and over again. So we're kind of excited about the fact that point, uh, point uh, east two is going to be another variation on, on that same language. So um, so we'll have more to report for you on that, but we mostly wanted you to know that it's not going to be something dramatically different. Uh, next slide. And uh, finally, there was some conversation about the, the cafe on the ground floor, and we, we've shared this updated plan. The, and one of, one of the things we wanted to share with everyone is, I, I think, Kate, am I correct, the there was a letter that was shared with the members of the planning board. Yeah, so okay. yeah, the, the client team and our team have described some of the rationale behind uh, the difference between the footprint of the restaurant in the original plan and this footprint. So uh, 
we the the client team has been talking with a local restaurateur, Kevin Sullivan, who operates Luna Street Foods and now operates Purity Ice Cream. And um, if you read the letter, it says he, for example, was not interested in the original layout of the restaurant. Way too big, way too risky. But this current floor plan area is a lot more tenable for someone like him to take on, to invest in, and to see as a success. Um, not only for, for this market, but also for this location, like the some of the parking pressure in particular. Um, so, yeah. And, and the one more, so the, the rest of the floor plan, I'll just point out to you, the orange area to the right would be uh, for building tenants. So that would be some kind of more private function area, kitchen, um, lounge area that would open up onto that small portion of more privatized plaza. And, uh, and then obviously we have support space like trash and mechanical and the leasing offices, the purple area. The blue area, which we, interesting following on, on Kevin's letter, I did a quick Google Earth comparison of some restaurants that we all know in Ithaca for comparison. And I was actually slightly su surprised here too. So the blue area that we're identifying is somewhere around 3000 square feet, 3,200 square feet. And these are not super accurate, but I went into Google Earth and I looked at restaurants like Maxi's and Simeon's. And as an example, Maxi's Supper Club is about 2,500 square feet, something like that. So you could put Maxi's in the space that we've allocated for a restaurant, which made us feel pretty good that, you know, sort of some of the beloved restaurants that we think about in Ithaca, that there's enough space here that, that, that it could accommodate somebody like that. Simeon's around 2,000 square feet, I think less than Maxi's. Um, Just a Taste is like 1,500 square feet or less. Saigon Kitchen, 1,700 square feet. And again, we're someplace up north of 3,000 square feet. Um, and you know, as the owner group, when they eventually identify that tenant, we'll be able to tell you more. But until now, it's a space that we've sort of carved out for that use. Okay. And that's all I have. Kate, I don't know if you have any closing remarks or if we want to just turn it over. No, I think just that, um, you know, we're here to give these updates that were in the submission. We also, if it, um, we had a helpful meeting with staff recently to compare the NEG deck from May 2020 with where we are now, we can talk about that as a next step. Um, and we're, we're planning to be back in March and April. As Steve said, we're continuing to develop the Point East uh, too and the site plans. So um, it would be helpful to hear what will help the board envision this project as it moves forward. Great. Um, so there's no action tonight, but I still think we ought to maybe try to take this down in stages. Um, the two things that we, we ought to try to accomplish is we should give the applicant feedback on what we've seen, uh, and we should look at the old part three for this and decide whether there's a reason to reopen Seeker. Uh, Lisa had mentioned that a PRC is something that we should think about and maybe try to come to a decision on. Um, but before we do that, maybe we can go around and just react to what the applicants presented tonight. Uh, and Emily, if it's all right, I'd start with you. Rob, um, you know, I think whether it was last meeting or PRC, I think the, the applicant team is kind of doing what we suggested with the exterior spaces and really increasing plantings and connections uh, on those public spaces. So um, thank you for that. I think they're looking great. Um, I'm curious to know what the rest of the board says. I, I wish I could go last, but um, my question to the rest of the board is, are the benefits of this project outweighing putting parking on the first floor? For me, that's kind of the fundamental question. I'm disappointed in ourselves that we approved Point East 2 to have pool parking under it in the first place, um, because I think we only get one chance to develop our waterfront. And as great as the outside looks and having just a fundamental problem approving a project with parking under all three buildings. Thanks. Lisa's looking to break in here. 
I just want to say you did not approve Point East 2 with parking. It was uh, banked parking. Um, you did not do that. You did not have any plans for par- Point East 2. The furthest was, east building. It right was just there. that there was a parking lot there um, okay. as a sort of a placeholder. They removed the parking there. Okay. So, there was so a, we're yeah, reviewing yeah. all three buildings now kind of fresh and... Yeah. Okay. There, there was a building footprint that was approved preliminarily for pointies too, but that's all that was there. And that's, as, yeah, that's right. The footprint was approved, but nothing else. Yeah. Mitch. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, from my perspective, this is going to be a transformative project. I, you know, I think we should support making it happen. It's a beautiful development on the waterfront, and I think it'll be successful. But at the same time, it's the same thing that we saw last month and the same conversation I think we're going to have. And I don't think the applicant's in a position to change their mind about parking on the ground floor. But I agree with Emily. It's a disappointment. It's a missed opportunity. And I, I feel like we're getting into a, an issue with approved projects that come back to us and, and change, the, change the game a little bit. We've seen this uh, at Cuga Park. Uh, we've seen it at Astori, and now we're seeing it at City Harbor. So it's a little bit... I'm um, struggling with that, and um, it's it's putting us in in not a good position. And I I do think it's uh, disappointing to see um, previously activated ground floor space turn into parking uh, right on the waterfront. Daniel. Uh, yeah, let me mirror what's been said in my own words. Um, I think overall this is a great project and it's really going to stand out, but there's a massive missed opportunity with how the ground floor is met. Um, And as a developer, clearly there was an intent to be progressive here, but you're bringing a lot of density with not enough programming with a single retail tenant, both for the occupiers and those people who live here, but also the passerbys, uh, the people, you know, uh, coming to the medical center, uh, the people docking their boats. I think it's a massive opportunity, not even urbanistically, but as a, as a, you know, from a business point of view, right? You know, you're. I don't know if you're trying to mitigate risk by only having one steady tenant uh, on 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 the ground floor, but I encourage you to imagine a scenario where you have two successful tenants and you truly place make here in an incredible site. Um, Right. I think that'll be attractive to everyone. Right. Your prospective tenants uh, upstairs to the community, to the boaters, to to the passerbys. Um, But yeah, I agree. I think it's a big missed opportunity uh, uh, to to do covered parking in such an incredible location. Garrick. Yeah, what to say? I I agree with the comments of my colleagues. you win some and you lose some, I guess. And um, but I, I, I look at these things in totality, and you know I'm pleased to see that we can move forward right away with the, the third building as opposed to having to be a placeholder parking lot with uh, something to come in the future, like kind of a bird in the hand type of view. Uh, is it a perfect project? No. Would I rather than not be parking on the first floor? Yes. Uh, that said, I think Steve had a good point about to the extent the first floor was gonna be residential, it creates that awkward public private boundary that's sort of solved with the parking. You can push the public space right up to the parking garage. Um, so in some, I guess I like more than I don't like, and I'm you know excited about the project and think it's a net huge improvement and I'm happy to move forward with it. Elizabeth. I think I, I agree with everything that's been said. It definitely, would be nice to activate the uh, first floor rather than having parking. Um, there's also other uh, health issues that I would think of uh, when you have the public space and parking right there with exhaust and um, proper ventilation of that area, especially close to a um, cafe. I would, you know, I would strongly advise advise the developers to look at other um, collaborative or or um, uses that like daycare, gyms, you know, um, offices, 
there's something other than parking, but I, I really dislike the idea of using such an expensive space really for parking, right? Where there's an opportunity with the public moving through there for it to be something else. Um, physical therapy, I, I don't know, like, it, you know, the sky's the limit, but parking seems to fall short. Um, Thank you. That's um, my oh, sorry. For my own piece, I'll say that the parking at the very end of the promenade bothers me more than the parking under the building or buildings on the way to the promenade. Um, part of this, the challenge of this site is that you've got all, you're building a lot of public space. It's a huge amenity. And for the public space to get used, you got to activate it and lure people out to the very end. Uh, and a lot of what was doing that work is your commercial space and your commercial space has been cut in half-ish um, for what sounds like good reasons to better accommodate your tenant target and there's a business case for it and so be it but you know the activated space has been cut in half uh, and you've got parking on the ground floor and that parking yields you all of 14 spaces I mean what kills me is that the ground floor that I think matters the most, which is the building furthest out, I think you could get to something that would make people happy here and lose all of 14 spaces. And now I'm sure that those 14 spaces are very important, but when I look at the, the size of the parking lots for this project as a whole, it's very difficult for me to imagine those 14 spaces as the difference maker. Um, and so I, I get real stuck on that, which is not to say that I don't think it's a great project because it is and I want it to happen and I don't want to be the stumbling block for it. Um, well, Lisa's also saying in chat that the community center has also been removed from phase two, which I had not realized. Um, and that's also worth talking about. Um, but I think what I want to do is turn it over to Lisa and have her talk a little bit about what the board needs to decide vis-a-vis -vis seeker in these revisions because she's better equipped to, to walk us through that than I am, certainly. Uh, well, you could, um, the question is, are the changes significant enough that you should reopen Seeker? Whether or not you do that, I think the majority of the information about the project as previously proposed is in the part three. So for you to understand, you know, you know, some, so some of the categories maybe haven't changed at all, but the, the, the seeker describes the previously proposed project. So I think that um, that should be a reference for you in understanding the changes, um, whether or not you want to reopen seeker. And my understanding is we have that old part three digitally, but not on paper. Is that correct? Yeah, we can give it to you. Um, Next time, but yes, um, they're pulling it up. This is um, the applicant. Uh, the applicant highlighted some areas of change and provided a response, knowing that you were going to be thinking about this. They provided or, um, their view of whether or not Seeker should be a reopened or what the potential impacts were from the changes. Got it. If it would be helpful, and you know, so, like I think an important thing, to, and again, you don't have to reopen Seeker, but again, you should use Seeker. And the thing about Seeker, as you all know, is it's a balance. So some of the good things balance some of the bad things, you know, so that you're, um, so that when some of the good things are removed, that change whether or not you know that can change the balance. So you should just look at that. Sure. Yeah, Kate, if, if you wanted to walk us through some of the differences, I think that's that would be helpful. Yeah, and um, we don't mean at all to supersede the board doing this. This was just our very quick view, uh, and we can go through the document itself. But um, uh, let me also just put these side by side on the screen for a second. But I think um, one of the things that was just mentioned is there's a, a major component of the seeker document that is the community center that is described in the project description. It's described throughout the document as a mitigating factor and a public benefit. So um, the project team, you know, we've, we've put this in writing in our recent submission, but the, the 
project team does not have site control of that land and is still very interested in a community center happening and would be happy to work with the city to realize that um, the semantics of the phasing, you know, that that would have to be called phase three because this project was not built in the timeline that we thought it was going to be built in 2020. Um, so that's something to, to think about, but basically the, the project team uh, can speak to their real interest in the community center um, and can answer any questions there. So uh, general note that we did notice that the parking space numbers um, in the secret document do vary from between 425 and 446. So we have done our best in our most recent submission documents to be as accurate as possible according to what we have and what was in the traffic impact study and in the seeker, but just a, a note. Um, impact on land, uh, we, we would like to note that there is the potential to reduce or eliminate altogether any additional surface parking that uh, would need to happen on city owned land. Let me pull up real quick. And this is where we're getting that. This is the preliminarily approved phase two drawing from 2020. So you can see that the parking area gets pretty big here. It could even have attached to this for um, you know the turnaround that's there. And then there was a, a footprint at that time uh, for a community center. But in the current plans, and, and the reason, part of the reason that at this time we thought the development team needed more parking on city land is that parking that's being shared with golfers on city harbor owned land would not have been able to fit um, on city harbor land. Uh, but now in the current drawings, we just put all the resident parking under the building. So we wouldn't need any more parking on city land. So well, you wouldn't have been able to have parking on city land because parking on city land is for the public. So just to be clarified that. Yeah, that, I, right. Parking for the golfers would need to be taken away from City Harbor and put somewhere else. That was the that was why that was needed in that footprint. Um, also, Kate, if you show that site plan again, you can see um, if, if you wouldn't mind not not that one, the newer one. Yep, you can see if if they're not making it, you know, a new. Community center in this phase, you can see where the community center lies on this site plan between the two parking lots, just to point that out. And we can continue to look at this layout based on our most recent conversations with staff to make sure that it is meeting the city's desires. All right. Um, next, uh, there's no impacts on flooding based on published FEMA mapping. When we get to aesthetic resources, the seeker document was really focused on um, waterfront and distant views. Uh, and for the purposes of what we have in front of you, these distant and waterfront views have not changed. You know, as, as Steve showed in the renderings, the buildings look essentially the same from uh, far away. So this it's is a great example of where an, a place where the positives of the project didn't, of the original project maybe didn't cause an impact and maybe the impact could potentially be different. And again, you don't have to do this through Seeker, but I just wanna balance out what they're saying um, with yeah. your concerns that, you know, that changes the aesthetics and you maybe if originally ground floor parking had been proposed, that would have been dealt with in the aesthetic section because it would have had to be mitigated. For instance, I'm just saying like, that's an example. Another thing obviously like would, have been, yeah, yeah. would have been if, if parking were included in the ground floor in the original, that would have been in the seeker under aesthetic uh, resources. Um, in 2020, we did do design review for what the plans were then. And um, we will be comparing that design review to what we have now and doing it uh, uh, for the first time for Pointies 2. But so this, this section would have talked about how the uh, underbuilding parking is dealt with. And what we would have done at that time would be to go through the waterfront design guidelines. And based on our current review of those guidelines, 
the way that ground floor podium parking is being dealt with, with high quality architectural screening, fully enclosed landscaping, not visible from the waterfront or from pedestrian ways is in keeping with the waterfront design guidelines as a best practice. Um, so the seeker would have dealt with that, however. Um, next was open space and recreation. Uh, we didn't see any significant change uh, in those impacts. The, uh, you know, the square footage of the ground floor commercial has changed um, and now includes a marine operations uh, space in the Point West building, you know, in our current plans. Um, we've also increased some of the gathering spaces. And again, the team remains interested in being part of the realization of a new clubhouse uh, in collaboration with the city. Uh, next uh, is transportation. And this is where most of our focus is and uh, why uh, especially we've engaged SRF um, in doing the uh, parking study. So, uh, sorry, it's the parking utilization study and the trip generation review. So, um, our understanding, again, is that trip generation is the critical element of Seeker to be concerned with because, especially because this site is directly connected to the Route 13 corridor and the Willow, um, Willow Day intersection was extensively studied as part of the original Seeker. Um, so trip generation, as opposed to parking, is what our team sees as the critical piece in this section of Seeker. Um, and uh, so, as we said, it's no longer calling for additional parking density on land. Um, the approved surface parking count, and I'm gonna go to the page. On page 14. Um, the approved surface parking count was 400, uh, was 369. And what we have now, sorry, surface parking for 435 uh, is what was in Seeker. And what is currently in our plans is 369. So we actually see that as a win, that the current plan, there is a nuance in the temp temporary nature of those surface parking spaces in the seeker reviewed plans, but we, uh, the, our count looks like we have done the best we can with that by putting parking within buildings from, from that vantage point. Okay. Um, Mitigating factors on pages 15 and 16, uh, the, uh, we have engaged SRF that on page 15 and 16, it's talking about these mitigating factors. So one of them was the updated traffic impact study after completion and occupancy of phase one. So for today's purposes, we're considering Guthrie phase one. So, Shared parking on page 17. This is about the, okay. This is about the um, temporary nature of shared parking. So this paragraph um, uh, also says that the original demand for all the various uses for the waterfront, the restaurant, residents, golfers, medical office building, if those were all taken singularly, the demand for parking was 659. And we were able to reduce that uh, as part of shared parking to 445. So 445 is the number we arrived at in Seeker. As we've said, the current number of parking spaces today after we did the update according to Chief Parsons, um, from a streetscape perspective, yes, sort of unfortunate that we no longer will have parking spaces on the other side. You know, it won't feel as much like a streetscape, but on the other hand, um, 441 is fewer 
total parking spaces than the shared parking agreement 445 in Seeker. So from that perspective, although there is a, Lisa, jump in if, you, if it's helpful. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that part of that also is, I mean, you can go back and forth. I mean, a lot of this was, again, uh, parking is a great example, again, in Seeker where things were balanced. They wanted a certain amount of parking and they agreed to less amount of parking because you're getting all these, because, you know, the project had all these amenities. So, um, and, you know, part of the reason the parking is less is because the community center has been removed. And that was based on the fact that the parking would have to be expanded for the community center as well. So, so you know, I think that's a great, parking is a great example, another way of, you know, how things were balanced in Seeker. Things that could have impacts against a lot of parking with other amenities. So anyways, I think you kind of get the idea that, uh, um, right, I, we're, we're just about done. I, uh, yeah, we're, this is really it. Um, quick couple points. The, um, you know, noise, odor, and light, um, just something to consider if the community center is done, uh, just putting this out there that originally we all thought this was gonna be two phases of construction. If the community center happens as part of phase three, that will have a noise impact for construction, but Again, balancing that with the potential benefits of community center. So um, that would have been talked about had this been considered a three phase project at the time. Uh, and consistency with community character, there was sort of a major caveat in this seeker document that was bullet points from Chief Parsons about the need for emergency access requirements to be addressed if the project were to realize its full density of 156 parking spaces. So since, yeah, here they are. So since this approval, that's been the major, um, one of the major things that has happened, we have resolved those emergency access issues and are able to build 156 units as one phase. So. Thank you, I appreciate you walking us through that. Um... I want to check in with Lisa before I go around the room and ask the board how they're feeling about reopening Seeker. Uh, just about what do we need to have top of mind to help us make this decision about whether to reopen this process and what are our obligations? Like what what's the bar? Whereas if we think X is true, we have to do Seeker again. You want you're asking me that? I'm asking you. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, again, I think you can use Seeker as a way of discussing uh, the changes. If the, if the projects, if the project as revised, you know, changes that balance significantly enough that you want to document that and, you know, look at that. You could, you can achieve most of that same, uh, you know, effect through site plan review, but because the information in Seeker is so detailed, you know, like for instance, Kate was just saying community character. Well, you didn't say anything about the, um, they, you didn't say anything about community character, for instance, you didn't talk in community in that section about the community character that was promised of a new neighborhood and vibrant, because that was all good. So you didn't really have to mention that. So, you know, maybe you want to talk about how the change in that section, for instance, you know, it just gives you a platform to talk about the different changes. So oh, I don't think you have a specific obligation. It's just if you feel that the changes are significant enough that you want to take them through this process again, or would you rather do it through site plan review? Okay. Well, I think that that is a fair summation of the question before us. And I think I just want to ask everybody. So Emily, if it's all right, I'm going to ask you first. Um, I think the changes are significant enough that we could reopen it. You are very faint. I'm sorry. Could you say that again? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me better this way? I can. Um, I think the changes are significant enough that we should reopen Seeker. Fair enough. Daniel. Um, I agree. I think we should reopen Seeker. Garrick. Garrick. You're muted, Garrick. You're muted, Garrick. Oh, 
I don't know why my space bar is not unmuting me. Um, I, I don't know, Rob. I'm, I'm, I'm undecided. Um, can, can I just get a clarification? And I'm just, I may be confused, but the, the seeker that we approved last time said was, was for point east to coming later. Is that right? Well, the way, yeah, the way you had to do seeker was for the whole entire project. Now, some elements of the project at that time were not known, like what the Point East 2 building was going to look like. But we did know how many units it would have and how much parking there would be. So, so that you wouldn't have to, the idea was being so that you wouldn't have to reopen Seeker. You covered everything that the project was going to do. So, yes, that was considered, although not the what it would look like. Okay, but, but at this point, though, we would be approving a project with the third building spelled out. That's right. I mean, that seems like enough to me to look at it. If I'm following it correctly, that, that seems like that alone seems like worth going through the process, although I, I don't anticipate any problems. But now we have a real building as opposed to a hypothetical building. Seems like a big change. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. So I generally, generally agree with everyone, um, but I think the result of Seeker would still be a uh, neg deck. So the question is, do we wanna reopen and go through it just for the benefit of documenting the changes? Because I think the result would still be the same. Thanks, Elizabeth, I agree. Mitch. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think we need to belabor this. I would um, propose that we do it through site plan review, but I would seek some additional conditions or mitigations, if that's possible. Is that possible, Lisa? Absolutely. Yeah, that's where you're or? going to get yeah. the mitigation. Yeah, that's right. And I have my mind on a couple of things. So I think because these changes are being proposed and, and they're not um, modifying them based on our feedback that I think additional mitigations are warranted here. And I, I'd like to have that conversation. And just to, to verify, Mitch, you want to have that conversation in the context of site plan review and not reopen seeker. Correct. Um, that's mainly where I lean as well. I, I, I agree with Elizabeth that if we reopen it, we are going to get a neg deck, um, because the project is fundamentally the same project vis-a-vis -vis its, its major impacts. Uh, I do think the balance between benefits and, and costs to the, the environment, so to speak on this project has shifted and it, it has shifted in my opinion, in a negative way, um, but I mean, I think that balance is still positive. Um, and I don't know what that obligates us to. It seems like we have some leeway uh, to decide how we want to handle this. Um, I also feel like I heard a majority of board members say that they were up for reopening Seeker and felt like that was the appropriate way to, to do that. Garrick, I see your hand. Sorry, Rob, I, I just wanna, I, you know, if we can do it, in, I guess I want to I, I look at it, but I'm indifferent as to whether that's through Seeker or site plan. Okay. Um, okay. You know, so... I, I, I want to get to where we're going to go, but I, in, in terms of ministry, I certainly agree with Elizabeth. So, I mean, the outcome's not going to change on, on the seeker. So I'm just thinking of making sure we do due diligence to protect the applicant, to make sure we're going, you know, we're going through the right processes. If we can do it in site plan review instead of seeker, that, that's fine with me. Daniel, I see your hand. Yeah, I guess I, I was, I was unaware of our ability to look into this in site plan review. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I would want to act in good faith with, the developer, you know, and hope that that's reciprocated in site plan review. But um, if that's the case, you know, I, I think I'd rather go with that option, right? As opposed to open the seeker, because in this case, although there was a, a substantial difference, delivering the larger project in one swing, I think is a, is a, is a, is a better execution of the project anyways. Emily, you were the first voice wanting to reopen seeker. I want to see, how you're feeling now? I mean, I can be persuaded to do it in site plan review. Um, I think that's a better process. Um, I guess my my reluctance, or I guess my interest in opening Seeker was that phase two is now in phase one, and that seems like the biggest substantial change. But if we feel like we can document um, changes and mitigations well, then I, I can get on board with site plan review. Okay. And Elizabeth, you sounded, to my ear, a little conflicted on reopening Seeker from the beginning, uh, given that we ended up in the same place. Where do you sit now? 
I feel like we don't need to reopen it to come out with the same result. Okay. So I feel like the consensus is from the board, we don't reopen Seeker. We have a really hard look at these changes and what they mean and how we mitigate any negative impacts and site plan review. And that's our path forward. Is there anybody on the board who disagrees with that summary? All right, then that's the plan. Lisa, anything else we need to go over today? No, but I think with that direction, we can sort of map out a schedule for what we think uh, the, you know, the approval will look like, how long that will take. Kate, I see your hand. Uh, you know, until now, uh, just from a staffing point of view, we, we thought we were going to keep going with design and, and keep giving detail. But um, if there's any indication you might be able to give on how we should plan for the March submission, that would be helpful. And knowing that not everything will be figured out now. Uh, I'd love to see a site plan with 14 fewer parking places. And I have some suggestions on where that could come from. Uh, absent that, Lisa, what do we need to cross off next? Well, I, I mean, I do. Well, right, so I do think you've heard the board's comments. They've been extremely specific and um, you have a, you have tried to address them. I think the next thing is, are you going to go farther than you've gone um, to address them? Or are you coming back with the same project uh, that the most recent one? So really, that, that's where that, that's the decision you have to make. Right. Am I right? No, that sounds right. Um, you know, I, I'd love to see some some changes, and I think you know what those changes would be, and I think those are supported by the board as a whole. And you're going to show us a project next month, and we're going to move forward the best we can. You've been really clear in your comments, and really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. All right. Thank you, and Thanks. have a good night. Thank you. Good Thanks, night, everyone. everyone. All right. We're not that far off. We're a little far off. But not. We were ahead. Now we're behind. <laughs> and I'm sad. Well, uh, five minutes ahead to 20 behind on that one. one no, we knew it was going to happen. Next up is Catherine Commons. Catherine, I see yes. you and Arvind and Phil. Is there anybody else who's supposed to be in from your team? Herman. Uh, let's see. Herman Sieverdine was perhaps. Oh, there he is. I'm just letting him in. Yeah. Well, Phil Pajanski. He's here. Okay, good. So um, I don't know if you're waiting for me. So we did uh, we did not have a we do not have a presentation this evening. My understanding was that we would we're going to be discussing the um, part three of the fief, but we are here to answer any questions. Great. Well, that that's lovely from a speed perspective. Uh, <laughs> Not that, not that I don't enjoy your presentations. I think we all do. Um, no, but good. Um, let's just get into the part three. Um, Nikki or Lisa, could one of you bring it up and help us navigate what we need to focus on then? Or focus on there. Sure. Give me one minute. Sorry, I do not have it up. No worries. Can everyone see that? You make it a little big. Bigger would be better. Thank you. 
Good. Yeah, it's helpful. Thank you. Okay. I don't, there's not that much of a difference from the last time you looked through the fees. Um, I would say we did receive a memo from ILPC if everyone had a chance to look at that. Um, Is that the Brian McCracken memo? That's the one. All righty. And it's pretty much in general, the commission does not see any substantial, there, there is not any substantial adverse impact. Great. For the historic resources. Yeah, in general, very in favor. Lovely. Um, so that's helpful. We have looked at this, it seems like a lot. And I remember feeling that this was fairly buttoned up. Uh, but I do want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do here. Uh, and I don't really want to go page by page because I feel like that is not that great to do in a meeting on something we've already read 10 times. Um, but anything that you just want to make sure we get everybody's eyes on before I start looking for a vote? Sure. I would say the only thing, or not the only, but things to look at would be... Um, community character and just looking at, sorry, this is probably making me, the consistency with zoning. If you had a chance to look at that, just the lead agency comments for each, which you all said last time for each of those variances. Um, so if you paid attention to that, that's great. And then I know that we did have some, we had a public comment and actually at one of the public meetings about construction logistics. I don't know, Lisa, if you wanted to talk about that, um, but it was about closing Catherine Street and Correct. keeping that open for pedestrians, providing a safe pedestrian walkway. Yeah, the, I don't know if the applicant has updated information since uh, the meeting that we had about this with um, engineering. Uh, yes, um, and I've heard that's you, something you can, yeah. And who, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so uh, following the meeting that we had uh, with the city, um, members of our team, including Herman Sieverding, uh, met with Tom Parsons on site and they worked out uh, an agreement uh, for a plan uh, for how pedestrians would be handled and how construction would be um, and, and maintaining access to uh, the fire department, which was a, a primary consideration of Tom Parsons. Uh, and so uh, a plan was worked out and um, that has been documented by Frank Santelli, uh, the civil engineer. Uh, and Herman, my understanding is that you distributed that to the city? Yeah, the revised, sorry, this is uh, Herman, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah, the, that revised uh, plan that incorporated Tom's uh, comments and the results of our on-site meeting uh, was distributed. Uh, we had the follow-up meeting with uh, Tim Logue, acknowledging uh, you know the plan to keep both uh, the south side of Catherine Street and the south side of Cook Street open for pedestrian traffic during construction, as well as have flaggers control uh, traffic so that emergency vehicles can get through uh, with Tim Logue. And so, uh, I, I think we're pretty well set on that, you know, subject to, uh, you know, once we get going, applying for the appropriate street permits for that. But that plan was was sent out. Okay. So I, any... I think- Go ahead. You received it, Lisa. Um, and, uh, and I know it was sent to Tim Logue as well. Do we need to revise the construction impact section of this to accommodate that new information? This is maybe a question for you, Nikki. We we can put that in there. Yeah, okay. I have not seen that, so okay. I can put it in there once I see it. That okay. Plan. Yeah, and as long as you, you know, as lead agency are good with that idea yeah. of keeping those, yeah, the sidewalks open. Yeah, that seems, seems like a benefit. I uh, also say the italicized paragraphs on pages 14 and 15, which I assume is that section you're referring to, which attempts to uh, encapsulate board sentiment on this, to my mind, uh, is accurate and reasonable encapsulation of that conversation. Great. Um, 
maybe with that, it's just worth going around our metaphorical room and checking in with board members before we call for a vote on the neg deck, just level of comfort on where we are with the part three uh, and a potential neg deck. Emily, could I start with you? Sure. I'm so excited about this project and, and getting these awesome public spaces uh, up and running in the, the active ground floors for, for College Town. I think it's going to really transform the street and the College Town. So um, just in, in terms of part three, yeah, I agree with you, Rob, those sections that talking about mitigations, I think, capture what we talked about before, and I am comfortable to move forward. Great. Daniel. Uh, same, I'll, uh, you know, I've uh, been following this project before being on the board and now being on the board, and I'm comfortable with the direction that it's been taking. Um, so far, so good. It, it has my support in its current condition. Thank you. Uh, Garrick. Yeah, I'm also good to go. Elizabeth. I agree. I think this is a great project. And um, of course, as part of construction logistics, we need to keep sidewalks open, but I'm sure the applicant realizes that. And um, yeah, this definitely support uh, neg deck on this. Mitch. Part three looks good. Awesome. With that, I'm going to look for a motion for the proposed resolution, a seeker negative declaration for this project, the orange resolution in your packet. I see Elizabeth move and Emily second. Uh, I'm going to do a roll call vote on this. Emily, how do you vote? Yes. Daniel, how do you vote? Yes. Garrick, how do you vote? Yes. Elizabeth, how do you vote? Yes. Mitch, how do you vote? Yes. I also vote yes, making this unanimous. You have your neg deck. That brings us to the BZA recommendations. Um, and conveniently, we just had in the part three an italicized summary in two paragraphs saying why these variances were necessary, which to me makes that pretty well sewn up. Uh, but I think it's worth having the board, you know, look at that, make sure that's what you're comfortable with us saying, making sure there's not something else you want to say to the BZA uh, to communicate why you believe these variances are or are not appropriate. Lisa, I see a frowny face. No, it's not a frowny face. Oh, good. Sorry, I misinterpreted. Yeah, I mean, the, the under community character, there is a statement by the lead agency for each of the variances saying that there are no impacts. That can be the text of the recommendation along with um, that there are no negative long-term planning impacts for these variances. If that to me seems appropriate. I think, I think the italicized little paragraph saying why so that's the applicants. That's, that's the applicants. Oh, fooey. Yeah. Well, I misinterpreted yeah. it. No wonder it was so positive. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so underneath the italicized art Got it. is the lead agency. That makes sense. Uh, well, great. So we do have language for that. Is there anything mm -hmm. we want to add to that language? Okay, maybe not. Anything else we should do on this project today, Lisa? Nothing else you should do, they will go to BZA at the beginning of March. And should they get their variances, they will be back before you potentially in March. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, in fact, um, I mean, we were wondering if we could uh, consider be uh, consider preliminary and final approval in March. Uh, we're, not, we're not sure what else it is we need to bring before the board. So normally um, what we would do is provide the uh, board with a draft list of conditions and that kind of helps shape that discussion. Mm -hmm. So that's what we'll do for project review committee. And that shapes the discussion of what would be outstanding and that sort of a backwards way to get into if how close, how much, how ready you are for final is to make what the conditions would be on that approval. So. Right, so that, right, so that'll be uh, two weeks from Friday, I think then is the project review, something like that, yeah. Okay. All right, anything else today? And and I guess also just, uh, so um, I, I guess th th this is just, we so we need a recommendation to take to the BZA, right? So, and I guess, I guess it's just, you've said that you're 
approve it, you agree with it and you're recommending it. So there's nothing more formal than that. We will, we will write a memo to them with the okay. recommendations. Yep. Okay, great. And we'll, and we'll send it to BCA. Sure. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That brings us to the expansion of a religious facility at 102 Willard Way and 107 Lake Street. Hey, Jason, do you have anyone else with you tonight? You're muted. muted. Yes, uh, it's possible someone will join, but uh, if they're not here, we can we can move forward. Mary Burke, possible. Yep, Mary Burke, David Burke, Ellie or Hannah Silverstein. All right, looks like uh, your team's here. If you would, please take it away. Okay, share my screen. All right, um, I will try to move through quickly. I know there is a new board member here. I believe most of you um, uh, saw the presentation back in 2020. Uh, just before the project was paused due to the pandemic. Um, so, but for the sake of time, um, although last project, you guys moved along uh, quite quickly, but uh, I'll, I'll try to keep the pace going. Um, so context map, uh, project site is 102 Willard Way, Lake Street, uh, or 107 Lake Street is a house adjacent to the existing uh, Chabad Center. Um, Chabad is a, you know an outreach center for Jewish student life. Um, I just want to give you a quick overview. It's it primarily caters to uh, students on the, the weekends, but it's open to the community. Uh, but, but the predominant user is students that walk from campus. As you can see on the context map, the, the cookhouse and the edge of campus starts um, right here in the lower right. Um, a lot of fraternities, sororities, and student housing around, as well as single-family homes uh, to the north. So it's a it's a mixed use and um, um, mixed residential type of, of neighborhood. Um, uh, one thing I just want to say about the operation is uh, it's primarily a Friday night event. That's when the Sabbath starts. There's dinner, and then Saturdays there's a lunch. Um, that occurs roughly every week during the, the school year. Um, and then during the week, it is primarily more like a, um, a, a low intensity classroom type environment, a library might be a, a better way to describe it for um, religious education. And uh, so small groups of people, it's really that, that one night, Friday night where uh, it changes. Um, so th that's the context map. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the, the site from past meetings. So I'll just move through that quickly. Um, and this is all in the packet. The materials palette is just picking up on uh, the existing building and uh, playing off of that. Um, and also trying to build a architectural character consistent with um, the neighborhood, although there is a mix of, of buildings through, through the neighborhood. Um, so let's see, um, supplemental submission here. I already talked about, uh, the operation of the facility. One of the, one thing I want to point out is, um, sorry, let me go back here and I have to remember to slow down a little, uh, cause I know there's a little delay and now my computer is delaying. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. Um, so on the right hand side, assuming that's up, that's the existing facility, uh, the shoal or the, the primary gathering room. 
is in the lower right here. What, what happens currently is um, 50 to 100 people might show up on a Friday night for that intense um, evening or occupant, intense occupancy. Um, and it, it spills out sometimes into the lawn or onto the deck. Um, and there's a dinner and a religious service component and it's a musical chairs with furniture and everything. Um, so they've been struggling to have dedicated space for the, the various components of their programming. Um, so that's what this addition project will do. Um, we're gonna keep the shoal, the, the primary meeting room in the existing building. Um, we're adding a small office space for the head rabbi. Um, uh, we're gonna keep, keep a meeting room. The connector comes through, we'll add bathrooms. At the top of the screen is a women's mikvah that we had done a few years ago. Uh, we're gonna add a, a men's mikvah in there. And then the primary addition area is a large dining room and uh, uh, kitchens to support that. And then a small classroom space, which will also serve as more like a, a child drop-off area. So I, I mentioned childcare in the narrative, uh, but it's not a, a childcare or a daycare type facility. It's uh, just supporting any members that, that come and, and have children. Uh, it's just a place to accommodate them. And then also, uh, you know, a Sunday school type class um, could occur uh, with the children in that room, but it's not a, not a daycare center. And then the whole addition sits above a 10 space parking garage with some support spaces, stair and elevator in the, the right-hand corner. Um, so, so that's the overview of the project and how it works. Again, I know it's um, uh, familiar to most of you. Um, so now I'll breeze through um, the updated submission from uh, February 4th um, narrative was mostly the same um, uh, initial, you know, the first part, we added a little bit more documentation to support the, the part three. Um, so hopefully you've all had a chance to, uh, to look through that. One thing I just wanted to uh, highlight was uh, we did a parking survey of the existing students to establish uh, uh, the beginnings of a, what kind of um, mode share there was for um, uh, arrivals on that Friday night. Um, so we were coming up with about 12 people driving out of 100 um, as, a, as a rough average, but that's in the report. Um, and again, it's, uh, you know, one, one component of the Jewish tradition is you, you really can't be driving a vehicle um, if, if you're um, uh, following uh, the traditions strictly. Um, and I think there's also a culture, um, in speaking with the organization, you know, even the, um, uh, less devout, um, uh, people that come to the facility, um, are reluctant to, to bring cars. And that's why it's, it's more of a, a walking experience. And, and that is the one, one larger variance that this project uh, will need. Uh, so we wanted to provide that additional information. Um, I speak a little bit more about the archeological and historic resource that is identified at 107 Lake Street, the house of William Strunk Jr., the author of Elements of Style, he, he lived there. Um, we've, we've had um, historic Ithaca and crowd walk through uh, the facility of the building last week um, to make an initial assessment. And we're talking with them about salvage. Um, and then there is also another person interested in attempting to relocate uh, the building. It might have to be taken down in pieces. Um, so, uh, you know, we are open to um, uh, working through all of that, but we don't have any clarity on what it, what, what that means, you know, there's a demolition, a traditional demolition component. Um, so there's a cost there. So we're looking to, uh, try to strike some balance between that and, and promote, um, reuse and, and salvage. Um, and, and, um, uh, yeah, salvage, uh, preservation of the house obviously is, uh, difficult programmatically. Um, it's not the most interesting architectural example, I will say. There's only a few elements that could easily be salvaged, but I understand there's um, other elements to that. Um, uh, so moving on, we've developed a little bit more of landscaping. Um, tell you what, let me uh, let me get um, landscaping site design um, storm. Uh, yeah, here uh, let me just say I. I I brought in my uh, uh, civil engineer to do a, a more detailed initial assessment and my initial uh, 
statement about um, underground storm chambers um, uh, will work. They did a more accurate preliminary sizing, and um, so that that process is in the works. But we should be easily should easily be able to handle uh, the stormwater, even the new uh, seven point five six uh, hundred year storm uh, events. Uh, that's um, when I was here last. That number was about five and a half um, inches. So um, DUC has has increased that number. Um, utilities, there's more development on that. I'll show you on the plan in a second. And there's now a statement about how we'll meet the Ithaca code supplement. And then finally, um, I had a geotech engineer. We walked the property, examined the basement. And when we did the mikvah, we're aware of um, rock in the uh, eastern portion of the site. But really, the addition in the parking garage barely digs into the existing site. We So we see a conventional foundation system. And... Um, do not anticipate any uh, uh, difficulties with um, any rock that might be encountered. It should be rippable shale in very small quantities. So um, again, I've split the original site plan, which was more of a hybrid of multiple things. Um, we did have a previous demo plan, but I made a little bit more clarity and I'm showing the trenching across the street to bring in water sewer um, and, and the storm water. So a little bit more clarity, uh, I think more to help uh, uh, planning staff work through the, the part three. Uh, so that's in the packet now. Uh, site utilities plan. One thing I want to note about this plan is um, uh, I had some uh, back and forth with Tom Parsons uh, last week and um, uh, he didn't seem to really have um, any major concerns. Uh, we do want to add a fire hydrant. So we'll be adding as we bring in the new fire service water line, we will add a fire hydrant on the side of the property. Um, but thus far, I haven't heard anything from him. Um, uh, there'd be a deal breaker. You know, we're looking at hose lengths to get around the building and, and service the existing and new. So, um, you know, it's, it's a technical process and I'm sure we'll, we'll get through it. Um, uh, new site plan here, but I, I did make one revision um, uh, uh, as a result of the PRC meeting. So I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, new, much more developed grading plan. Um, we managed to, um, the reality is we have to take the whole sidewalk out with the utility crossings and, and the project development. So we realized we, we can change that slope and just, and it's not too bad as a, um, a climb back up to meet the original sidewalk. Um, if we do that, we were able to get the 8% grade on the driveway. So we eliminated that uh, uh, variance request. Um, so we've got a full 8% grade all the way into the parking garage. Um, so I think that's plenty on grading. Jason, Mitch, uh, now Jason, we've Jason, sorry to interrupt. Mitch was wondering, um, yeah, if you could show that you got that you no longer have that circular turnaround because not everyone is at PRC. So I think that's a big Yeah, change. I'm going to get to the site plan okay. in a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So planning plan is, is separated out and and much more developed. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're working on a, a, a dense screen up here. We've had um, multiple conversations this week with the, the owner, the new owner of 109 Lake Street. Um, and I, I believe uh, she has submitted a letter today, um, or I know she submitted a letter today. I don't know if everyone had a chance to look at it, but we're managing, we're not gonna bring water onto the site dark sky compliant lighting fixtures. And that's what we're, we're looking at here. And then uh, amending the tree screen or, or creating this tree screen here, but also keep it in um, the height, um, no, no taller in the building because they're worried about um, potential solar panels on their building. Um, I, I will add that we're gonna add a little bit more screening at the back to isolate their property from, from the playground area. Um, so we're in conversations with the neighbor um, uh, to, um, mitigate any any impact um, that would would go that way. Um, uh, so yeah, a little bit more detail here. One thing I want to note is I have a plane tree um, right in this space here. Um, uh, once a year, uh, uh, the the Sukkot uh, ceremony, um, uh, Jewish holiday occurs, and they need a space that's open to the sky to set up a, a sukkah um, and. Uh, we had talked about back in 2020 about a, a possible expansion of this project to include a roof deck to accommodate that um, 
uh, activity, but we just don't know that funding is going to get us there. Um, so this proposal does not include that roof deck and, um, you know, possibly the playground could serve that purpose, but the courtyard um, is another opportunity. So in the light of the, in light of the fact that, that we need areas that are open to the sky, um, and you'll see in some renderings I have, I'm replacing this plain tree that was submitted with a, uh, a more ornamental tree. Um, uh, but I think you'll be happy once you see the, the rendering. So anyway, more detail on that. And then the last page in this packet was um, some more standard details and some information about uh, the plantings. And um, uh, I'm looking into this light fixture a little bit more. I, I like the the design of it, um, it's, a, it's a dark sky compliant fixture, um, all the lighting's hidden up above. So I'll, I'll amend that and um, develop all this a little bit further as we go forward. Um, and um, let me get the site plan up here. But yeah, the circular drive was eliminated. Um, let me zoom in. Um, and then on the submission, I was thinking this might this existing driveway apron, we'll call it, um, would be a great drop-off for Lyft and Uber or taxi, things like that. But really it's in the uh, uh, public right away. So we got rid of that as a result of, of PRC. But yeah, this is all landscape area in front of the building where that drop-off was. Um, one other thing I wanna point out is um, it, it didn't seem to work well to handle trash and recycling through the parking garage because of the the pickup and the steep grades out here so we ended up adding a sidewalk around the mikvah the current dumpster is over here um and recycling um uh bins and you know after the events during the sabbath i mean that's really the the big event except for um the, you know the the primary jewish holidays um uh, the students and and some volunteer student organizations they help with the cleanup. So after every event, all the garbage and recycling can be rolled or or walked out and and stored here. And that's the current system of of pickup is is from this driveway. So um, that's one thing that changed. And you know we've got the bike storage in the uh, front of the parking garage, and there are two um, uh, bike racks so for parking bike spaces um, in front of the existing building here. Um, so again, just quick refresher, the, the office additions over the front yard line, about a foot, the back corner of the building is about a foot over the side yard, but much further away, um, towards the front. And then the front is over, um, about three, th 3.2 feet, um, up there and kind of runs back. It was all due to the alignment with the, the mikvah and a bigger program for the building that we slowly um, uh, squeeze down to try to try to mitigate um, all of this. Um, although the whole neighborhood is in the front yard, and so that doesn't seem too major. And then the mikvah, because it's now attached to the building, is no longer an accessory building. That's what triggers a rear yard. It becomes part of the primary. Um, Eight percent slope on the drive. I got rid of that variance, and then the parking um, uh, variance um, uh, is the the last one and the big one. So uh, just quickly here. Um, oh, this before is... we move on, uh, there was a question in chat about the difference between the light green and the dark green areas on the plan. Uh, light, light green. Um, uh, technically, you know what this, yeah, the graphics didn't quite come through. So the, um, this whole front yard really should be dark green um, because we're, we're lightly touching it, but during construction, it'll be, you know, pretty well disturbed. So it'll be um, disturbed area. The existing curb cut um, that uh, that we're closing up, that really should be a dark green. So, and then, so that's really what the dark green is intended to, to convey is um, disturbance. The, um, uh, if you look back at the, the demo, you know, this kind of fill region that really tells you um, exactly what part of the site is, is disturbed. Um, so, but yeah, that's, um, yeah, that didn't quite come through. We didn't, didn't quite manage all that. So yeah, those front yard planting areas lightly, lightly developed, but they are developed. So they, sh they really should read as dark green. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to do a before and after this is the front, um, previously submitted 
and that's it now we've got more trees this um uh, red bud is the plane tree location on the right here uh, but there's three of them now across the front uh, so it's a little more lush and you can see the circular drive is is gone in this um, and then the front before and the front after we've now added windows in the top of the um, overhead door uh, that leads into the parking garage. Um, so um, yeah, the landscaping now pretty much uh, completely conceals that, that elevated patio area. Um, moving on, just the night view. Uh, I turned down the lighting on the inside in the proposed because it was a little bright. Um, and I think I was over lighting uh, in that previous rendering. But um, yeah, we want to avoid light trespass. Everything is is down lighting. Um, uh, we did have one up light on on this tree. But yeah, I think I, I don't think that's needed. I'd rather do a, a moonlighting technique to light it down or eliminate it. So we can uh, we can continue just to discuss that um, at the next uh, um, board meeting. Um, and then last view is before uh, 109 is on the left here, Lake Street. Uh, so looking up Lake Street towards the facility, this is before and then and then that's after. So just a little bit more landscape and, and softening in the front. Um, I think that, that'll do it. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Our actions for this are potentially a neg deck, um, but it might be worth talking to the board before we just dive into the part three. Uh, just see if there's any questions and comments on what we've seen. Uh, Emily, if it's all right, I'd start with you. Questions or comments? Right. Daniel? Um, uh, no major comments. Uh, I did have one about the, um, in the, the last couple set of renders, there was a railing on the rooftop uh, above the garage uh, area. Um, I was wondering, is, would that be an accessible outdoor space? Uh, the railing that, on the table a, part of the... Yeah, that right now it's, it's more of an architectural element. Um, we had done feasibility work um, back in 2018 we had uh, and this some of this was discussed at the, uh, the 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 two or three meetings three planning board meetings in 2020 before we paused at the pandemic um when at the start of the pandemic but um we had a a roof deck again to support that um uh sukkot ser uh holiday once a year um and the whole idea with that is the the dining room would move up to the roof, but at this point, it's not part of the proposal. It's a future um, plan. And that, that would be probably the more likely future um, component coming down the line. We did have a, a, a portion of this, of a second floor behind that, that roof deck. Um, but that's even further down. And back in 2020, we even showed a potential expansion of the shoal off the existing building, but none of that is is on the table at the moment. So right now that's an unoccupied um, deck. Uh, Tom Parsons may appreciate the stairwell going up to the roof. I don't show that um, in any of this. You wouldn't really see it from this view or you might just see it um, through the railing, but that stair might go up to the roof for, for fire access. Noted, yeah, I appreciate the context. I'm, I'm newer here, but uh, otherwise great project and I appreciate the extra landscape. Mitch. I think the change to the front is great. Um, it looks much better. It looks like it's fitting in a lot better. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I think the 107 building, it's really important that you work that out. And, you know, if it's moved, that's ideal. And that would be incredible. But I know there's huge challenges to that. But at the very least, it should be um, done with the, the crowd uh, organization for selective demolition and recycling. I mean, I think that, that has to happen here because um, that's an impact taking that building away. And I, I guess I wasn't really aware of the, the important history to that. And then my last question is um, the sidewalk, uh, this path that comes straight to the road from the stair on the side, I'm not sure that's needed. I think that's actually a safety concern, right? You don't want people walking into the street mid-block 
and not without a crosswalk. And I, I would propose you take that out. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, that piece, the extension from the sidewalk to the curb exists today. It's very steep though. So I would agree. And it's, it's just would, a sidewalk. I would so take it out. I'm just showing the existing condition, but yeah, we can take it out. Yeah. Eric. Yeah. I just agree with everything Mitch said. I feel the same. Elizabeth. Sorry. Um, yeah, I um, think the changes look good. And um, I agree with Mitch. You might want to consider taking that. But everything else looks great. Lisa. Yeah, I just had one comment about I'm so sorry that you can't keep the London plane tree because you're removing so many trees on the other site. And, you know, this is what we we don't really need more ornamental trees. We need big shade trees. And that's what we're losing. And that's what we need to replace. So um, I'm hoping you can reconsider that or add shade trees into the tree lawn or something else. I mean, red buds are pretty at a certain time of year, but they're not really substantial trees in any way. Um, so. This is exactly my comment. I would make that comment too, because you're removing really big trees, really big DBH trees. And uh, red buds, wild nice. Yeah, they're also not native here. Just for FYI, not that it matters, but you know. Dude, we have very the many have, red buds, why does the many red have buds. To come out? I didn't understand that. Why does it have to come out? It's not in yet, right? It was a proposed tree. The proposed they, tree yeah. the, oh. to replace the bigger trees that are being removed. And now they're I see. proposing I see. to change that out for red buds. Oh, oh yeah, no, I totally agree with, with you. It would the 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 tree canopy would shade the courtyard. Um well, that's is, good. But, may, <laughs> but maybe but somewhere I, I, then, maybe somewhere else you could get bigger trees in for. I yeah, I mean, it. one one example would if we could get the roof deck, if we, you know, if we can make that move forward, um, then we'd have that, um, you know, flex space up there, and then the plane tree could could easily. Then we wouldn't need the courtyard. Um, so we'll we'll continue to look at that. I'll I'll, I'll search the site as well for uh, a few more trees. Yeah, we need substantial trees, not ornamental trees. The ornamental trees are nice, but yeah. Still like them, but maybe some bigger ones too. All right. I think that takes us to the part three. Um, and there's some highlighted areas that are flagged for us to focus on. We also have Lisa and Nikki here to help us make sure we're looking at the right things uh, sufficiently. Uh, but the first highlighted area is the impact on historic and archaeological resources on page four. Uh, so it might be worth looking at the part three, you know, starting there. And I think this this speaks to Mitch's comment about the 107 Lake Street. So you can see what um, the applicant has said they'll do. And I don't know if that's, you know, proper mitigation for you all or if you want something more substantial. But they, they have said they're open to. You can read it right there on page four of the quotes. So I'm comfortable with the way this reads now, personally. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's if there's anyone on the board that wants that to change or strengthen that language, I think now would be a, a time to address that. Okay, I'm moving on to construction and halfish way down page six. There's a highlight for construction related impacts. Uh, and I didn't see anything concerning here. Is this just highlighted because it's new or is it highlighted because it's... Yeah, it's highlighted because it's new, exactly, Rob. And um, just whether that's enough mitigation for, they're saying what they're gonna do, which, you know, looks good. But if, if you could just read that and make sure it does for a lead agency. Sure. So you, you have to close the sidewalk on that whole side of the street during the whole construction period. Is that what you're saying, Jason? Uh, um, I, I, it wouldn't be the whole construction period. Um, I, I would hope that we could, we could get utilities in, um, start grading the site and maybe get that sidewalk in and uh, establish any disturbance in the tree lawn area and then, 
and then we'll have a silt fence all along the, the property line. So we'd, we'd work to not close that off. I mean, obviously the organization, we're hoping to stay open um, during construction. So uh, if everyone's walking, we want to keep the sidewalks open. Great. Mitch, yeah. I saw your hand. Sorry, just to go back to the, um, the house conversation. Um, I just want to understand what it means by, you know, they're looking into deconstruction salvage work, you know, and, and also the avoided cost of demolition TBD is available to anyone willing to undertake this endeavor. So does that mean like if crowd comes along and says this is going to cost X amount of dollars that the applicant would put forward the, the, the theoretical demo cost towards that cost of crowds work? Is that the way it would work? Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we will get a, a quote for demo. Uh, we'll look at look at that and anything that um, you know that's avoided cost, right? So um, we would we would put that entire amount. So just grabbing a number out of the air, you know, let's say say it was fifty thousand dollars. You know, I mean that you know it could be twenty to fifty in that range, depending. I mean, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, uh, to just knock a house down and haul it off. Um, but it's a, it's a lot more complicated these days with, um, hazardous material. The, the siding is all asbestos on the house. So, um, so there's a mitigation component. So that's why I think 50 is more, um, on the order of magnitude, but we will find that out. I just don't have that number. And now that crowd has walked through, we can look to see what the cost is. My only concern is if they come back and say, we can deconstruct the house for $250,000, that's that's a tough one to to say we would absorb it all. You know? how, how did it work for um, Catherine Commons, Lisa, the funding of the, the deconstruction of those 11 buildings? Where did that, was that all born by the, contra, by the applicant? Um, I'm not sure how that worked. I can find out. Um, I, I believe that it was how much that house was going to cost to demolish the same thing as Jason. They didn't pay for the whole deconstruction. We'll find out for sure, but they didn't pay for the whole deconstruction. It was more than it would be than just demolishing it, but they, they did put the demolishing funds towards it. Maybe they got some grants. It would be interesting to know. There some I grants. Think they probably got some grants and they had a lot of volunteers. Um, what about timing? Will you work with people, you know, will you work with them for deconstruction? the time it would take to deconstruct? Yeah, so interestingly, right now, 107 is unoccupied. There was a potential, um, uh, there was some interest in, in renting it um, really for the next uh, school year. Um, in a perfect world, and I just don't see this happening, Happening construction breaks ground in the fall. Um, it's not the best time. So I kind of think it's a spring 2023, 20, but with, with the house currently unoccupied, I mean, um, the one person who expressed interest in moving it, if if she comes forward with a plan and says she can move it, I mean we can move it tomorrow, you know. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try to um, move that process along um, while we're waiting for the construction documentations and pricing um, and then fundraising to complete. There's there's been uh, movement on the pricing side, but no one knows what things are gonna cost these days. So you know we gotta we gotta clear. Um, that, that whole component of the project. So that'll take some time, you know, throughout the rest of this year. So in that, in that period, we'll, we'll look at salvage and deconstruction or potential movement. Yeah. Are people comfortable with that answer? So on pages eight and nine, there are a number of highlights that just say lead agency. And I assume that this is the BZA response. Am I, am I reading that correct? Okay. Um, so are people ready to take that down in terms of how we feel about the, the BZA vis-a-vis -vis how it needs to be included in the part three? I'll say that my feelings on these variances are all that they are lacking any long-term planning impact. Uh, 
and you know they're, they're not bothersome to me but i have no strong feelings about them um and what do we need to say in a part three on this and i realize we just did this but it was pretty well baked when we were looking at this whereas this it looks like we're, we're coming up with language what are you looking for nikki or lisa or lisa can you hear me? It's less than me. Yes. Okay, yes. good. Sorry. Yes. Um, and I just want to make sure you know that parking, it was 24 total required off street. We, we just got the analysis. So there, okay. it's a 50%. Yeah. Ask a reduction. Um, it's like we went through other projects like we have. Uh, it's just going variance by variance. Like you can say you agree with the applicant, you know, like lot coverage. Um, they're over by 4%. It's, you know, maximum lot coverage is 30% and they're at 34%. So how do you think they're mitigating that? Or why do you support this variance? And we can do that for each of those. And maybe, you know, and it could be a similar reason for two or three of these or all of them. Sure. Uh, so we typically support the parking variances because we support less parking, you know, almost as a matter of course for planning reasons. Uh, so that that we could address specifically. Uh, with the rest of them, I, I feel like we got to talk about the benefits of the project um, and wanting to support community uses in this environment. So I feel like we can speak to that on all of them. Emily, do you have something? Yeah, I think the only one that is... Um concerning to me is lot coverage, but I would say I think they mitigate that with their proposed stormwater practices with the retention basin. Um, okay. So I offer you, that as a mitigation. You, lot coverage also means removal of more trees, so you could also... We're adding screening. That's helpful. Anything else anybody want to say on the, um, the variances in the part three, Lisa. Yeah, I, I know it's late and everything, but I just I just want to bring up that the part, I mean, and you can say whatever you want to say, but the parking, we it was something we specifically talked about at the training and how the planning board has a completely different mm -hmm. um, take on this than the BZA and that's fine. But um, it, it, just, to, just to bring your awareness to the fact that the BZA doesn't, generally support parking variances. And even if you say that it, they're good for planning purposes, it might not help the applicant. Sure. So, um, because they don't really take that into, con you know, it, because it's a 50% variance. So um, I would just, if you're going to rationalize it some other way that could be useful to the BZA, um, you know, you might like their parking numbers that, you know, or something would be probably more helpful. Yeah, I'll say that I don't have an argument to make it palatable to the BZA. Um, I mean, I think the, the thing that I took away from that training is that the BZA pays attention to a bunch of things that we don't. We pay attention to a bunch of things that they don't uh, and that, that we don't necessarily have ways to make things palatable to them all the time. And, you know, I, I think we could speak to a planning impact or we could speak to uh, a mitigation that we feel like exists. Uh, and I think I think we do that, um, but I, I don't necessarily know what else we would say. Emily. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about this parking variance in terms of the population using it, which will be largely students walking. And so mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something we want to put. It's, mm -hmm. it's listed there as what the applicant said, but um, yep. for me. Yeah, and that it's really close to campus. Thing. It's close to campus. Um, and so in a neighborhood downtown, we would worry about it because people would be driving and needing off street or, you know, parking on the street. But I don't think that's the case here. That's helpful. Thank you. Elizabeth. The other thing I'd mention is the that there is a public transport available to that. That's good. Let's mention that. Anything else on any of the part three, not just the, the variances. I feel like we've got some material for that. Um, but anything we want to look at in the part three before we start talking about a possible neg deck here. 
Is anyone not comfortable moving forward with the proposed resolution for a negative declaration? Is there a motion for the proposed resolution, negative declaration, the blue resolution in your packet? I saw Emily move and Elizabeth second. Um, I'll do a roll call vote on this. Mitch, you're the top of my screen, so I'll start with you. How do you vote? Yes. Emily, how do you vote? Yes. Daniel, how do you vote? Yes. Elizabeth, how do you vote? Yes. Garrick, how do you vote? Yes. I also vote yes, making this unanimous. You have your neg deck. It also sounds like we have what we need as far as language for the BZA recommendation. Just want to check in with Nikki to see if there's any remaining questions or needs there. I think we've got it. Yeah, awesome. thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that does it for this project for today. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Yep, you too. That brings us to Auden 2. Now, we do have a public hearing for this project. It's my understanding that there is a great appetite for participation in this public hearing, either through speaking directly to the board or through comments to be read into the record. We're going to do what we can in person first, and we'll fill in with um, the comments to be read to the set to, into the record as that dries up. Uh, we're also going to hold the public hearing today to 30 minutes. So it's very likely that we'll have to hold the public hearing open for the next session, but I don't necessarily want to let this drag on for an hour or more. Um, and so that's how we're going to handle it. Uh, with that, do we have an applicant yet? Or is there anything we want to say before we bring the applicant in, Lisa? No, I think you have it. Um, you can choose whether or not to have a brief presentation before that's normally um, something that is done before the public hearing. Oh, we should do it. I mean, that's 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 what we do. Do we need to make a motion for a public hearing? We do, okay. although we're going to have a presentation first. And if the applicant's team is all here, please take it away. Uh, good evening. Uh, let's see if there's the only other person I think that um, may be able to answer questions is Matt Newcomb. He's the I'm engineer. Okay, perfect. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're uh, thank you for hearing our project tonight, and we're looking forward to continuing the review. We're prepared to give a brief uh, presentation and some updates from uh, regarding the project, if you would like that. Please. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So just to give you a sense of the project's location, uh, it's located uh, adjacent to uh, the Fall Creek neighborhood, the Cornell campus, and the Ithaca Falls. It's, it's on Lake Street. Uh, the owner's property, uh, uh, Auden, uh, which was formerly the Gun Hill Apartments, is located uh, just up the hill. And so uh, just to give a brief description, the project's uh, proposes to construct new apartment buildings. They'll be primarily for, for Cornell students, and it's an extension of the existing uh, Auden apartments. The owners wish to expand their successful housing in Ithaca, and the site's adjacency makes it ideal for shared services and shared management. It's also an ideal location for student housing uh, in that it's near campus, uh, one of the few parcels that's uh, nearby and developable, but still walkable and bikeable, but it's also uh, doesn't displace any existing single family homes. Uh, it's a transitional uh, space uh, between the uh, Fall Creek neighborhood and the upslope neighborhood of uh, student housing and Greek housing and then the campus itself. 
uh, style and the materials that are being chosen will be sympathetic to to both of those neighborhoods uh, as best we can. Uh, it will bring 211 new beds spread over 71 units. And uh, 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 Kim, excuse me, Lisa, I just had a note from the architect, Kim Rosenthal, that she would needs to be let in. Uh, let's see, so 71 units, and they're a mixture of studio one, two, and three, and four bedroom units. The project will conform to zoning, including the maximum allowed four stories. It'll be constructed in four sections that step down the hill following the slope of Lake Street. The exception is that parking variance will be requested. There's no additional parking that's going to be built as part of the project. And uh, we have actually a little more information from the owner uh, about the current parking situation. Uh, so the lot, which is rented, is less than half full. And uh, uh, there are 273 residents currently living in Auden, and only 59 spaces are rented. So that's about 22%. Uh, so that would leave about 74 spaces for Auden 2, which actually has fewer proposed residents. Uh, the property will continue to offer a shuttle service on weekdays and to grow to the campus on weekdays and to the grocery stores on weekends. And they're considering a second shuttle uh, for the proposed project. In terms of sustainability, the buildings will be designed to the building will be designed to comply uh, let's see. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just checking to see if everybody had been let in. Uh, the building uh, will comply with the current green building uh, policy by, of the city for energy efficient buildings, systems, and, and no use of natural gas. Oh, sorry to bother you again, Lisa. Uh, Kim Rosenthal, the architect, just texted, says she's still not in. So it'd be Kimberly Rosenthal. Let her in. Uh, the, the construction will be a panelized method. And for those of you who've been in Ithaca long enough, that'll be similar to the way the newer West Campus buildings were constructed. So the, the walls are in sections and panels, but uh, much of the interior work and all of the exterior finishes, including the brick and siding and paint will be uh, constructed on site. And uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over to the architect. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, so uh, Michelle touched on, you know, most of the building. So uh, in, in this design, we we're really uh, working with a lot of constraints, but we worked within the confines to keep the building within the 40 foot height restrictions. And we, we created the building to uh, be in sections. So we have four different sections, as you could see on the screen in front of you, uh, section A, B, C, and D. Uh, we stepped them to go with the topography of the, of the site. Um, and in between each section, we have an elevator and a set of stairs for egress. Uh, the stairs also go up to the roof of each section. Um, that was the request of the fire marshal. And uh, we did you know, work with him as we were trying to do the layout and design of the building. Um, the, I'm thinking, um, Michelle, do you want to go to the next slide? Sure. Okay. so. Uh, this is just a, you know, a, just a plan or an elevation view of, of the front of the building, but you can see how the front of the building slopes with the road as it goes up the hill. So it is a four story structure. Um, and you can see how it steps with each section. And would you like to see the next elevation? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. So this is the rear. Um, these are retaining walls that are in the back. I mean, you, so that the hill would actually come down into these. So there it's like cut. So um, you could see how severe the slope of that site is just based on these retaining walls with the way it steps. And the lowest section down in the back, that's an area where Michelle's team has um, 
is planning for outdoor space for the students um, as well. Uh, we could go to the next one, Michelle. So these are the renderings that we worked through. Um, so as you're coming up the hill, you could see how the building kind of sits back off of the road. A lot of vegetation is, is put back on, onto the site. Um, it, it, it does help with some of the noise, but it also you know, softens the view of the building from the, from the road as you're coming up the hill. Um, the retaining wall helps us just with that corner, but it also helps us with egress to get in and out of the building. It gives a nice little separation too, away from the uh, Lake Street. Um, you could go to the next one, Michelle. And this is just a view as you're coming down the hill. So right as you're coming around the corner, this is the front of the building. So I don't think there's a whole lot that you would see from the residential area, but I believe Michelle has more um, views of that portion as well. Uh, M M Michelle, ac actually, before you end your sharing screen, I, I just wanted to point out the uh, the change to the fire lane uh, before we move on. I, I think that's going to be relevant. Uh, sure, Jacob. I was I was planning to talk about that a little bit uh, later in terms of updates, but sure, we could talk about that now. Um, so the the fire lane has been something that's been of concern to the uh, a number of uh, residents to the planning board, uh, to some common council members in terms of how it would look. And so we had a conversation with Chief Parsons last week, which we documented with a letter that was shared with uh, staff. And um, in response to some comments about the curve, uh, the chief said that it would be okay to reduce the amount of lane and that it really didn't need to wrap around the corner. Um, he also said that uh, he understood that this that there's functional needs for a building, including uh, deliveries and mail. And so this lane can be a shared lane. So he's agreed that it could be 50% fire and 50% uh, 15 minute loading. So uh, that was something that will be signed. And the mail room is in this part of the building and with concerns about uh, uh, this potentially being a somewhat blind corner, uh, the loading zone will be in this area. And then the fire lane will be in this area. And then the other thing that, uh, 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 Chief Parsons uh, agreed to was that the this lane could be paved in a different material so that it doesn't look like the street. Uh, so we're looking at something like pavers or uh, some sort of decorative concrete uh, that's yet to be determined. Uh, so the other part that we could chat about while we're here is that we also had a meeting with Jean Grace, uh, the city forester, and uh, she agreed with uh, Robert Wesley's assessment that the vegetation here was, uh, that it was a highly disturbed site and the vegetation is largely non-native invasives. And uh, she didn't have uh, a lot of problem with the vegetation being removed. She was, uh, she was supportive of the plant materials that were selected with a few comments on uh, some we needed to be a little more thoughtful about uh, deer resistance and because there's a lot of deer pressure here. And then uh, some varieties she was suggested might be a little narrower. Um, so those are those updates. So I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, at the PRC meeting, it was discussed that uh, we're hearing that the visual impacts and views from the neighborhood are, are very uh, important and, and of con certain concern. And so we've been working on some models and we had suggested some view locations to staff, but we're thinking that for tonight, it might be best if we shared that model live and uh, Ife Yan will be uh, walking you through that. Okay. Hey, um, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, so, okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, so we 
got some comments from the PRC and also um, talked with the staff to discuss some of the potential views that we want to see for this project. So the first view, view will be coming from the Ithaca Falls Trail right here. And then we took a bunch of photos uh, around this neighborhood and this train here where we, well, when we have the buildings. So this is still in winter and we um, are looking at the site is around the corner right here. And as we are going to the, uh, the model view. So this is actually on the set, well, on the left side of the sidewalk, uh, the Ithaca Falls Trail. Um, so we have a bunch of vegetations on those. You can you cannot see anything um, regarding the building. But if we go into the, the air, um, have to be this high able to see the building right here. So that's our Alden 2 buildings. And then in the back, that's Alden 1, just for reference. And then number view number two would be right here. So from the Lincoln Street and also the Aurora intersection, looking from the neighborhood. So we have currently just a bunch of residential buildings looking toward the site. So the site will be behind the, those buildings. And that's the reality. That's what you're gonna see from the neighborhood. And we cannot see any of our Alden 2 building. Okay, so, I just wanna say that normally when you do uh, visualizations like this, you keep the leaves off the trees because six months of the year, there aren't any leaves on the trees. So I would update the visualizations to not have the leaves on the trees. We, we, we do have uh, versions of each of these views um, without uh, leaves on the trees. Um, we, we were just having some trouble including that in the live model, um, oh. but we, we can sh send those. Um, I, actually, I saw that. So in this view, the leaf or no leaf doesn't really matter because the building is the main factor that's heading the, uh, the Alden 2. But once we go back to the uh, view number one for winter. So this is what you're gonna see during the winter time. You can see a little bit, you see that uh, white and blue, that's our building in the back. Um, and then, so number three would be right here. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Number yeah, Aponi, could we see the picture before again? Because I don't remember seeing that many trees before the model. It's for on that one? first view, that first viewpoint that you just showed us in the winter. Sorry, I, and we had a question from in chat that said that too. Is it really that dense? Yeah. So, yeah, and Emily says, and I agree, it'd be better to have Photoshop images with real trees, like having that and then your model right there. We agree. I'm seeing the same thing of the number of trees in that. So these are, as of today, this is a live model to help us place this stuff. Okay. And for the for both those reasons, Lisa, there's no reason to show them with the leaves on. We should be showing winter views. Exactly, because we know it's only going to be better. With yeah, yeah, of course. And I would and say so when we'll you're look looking up the street too, like King and Queen, you should yeah. be in the middle of the street, not angled. Yeah, so that ag agreed. Are. We'll We'll, um, this is a live model. We thought it'd be fun to show, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it looking tremendously real right now. So we'll update those with Photoshop and, um, and have those for your next meeting. Great. We, uh, we were hoping this would be fun and good, but this, these aren't looking real to me. Everybody likes fun and good. No, there's, yeah, definitely a fun element. There. Yeah. Uh, is right. there anything else we need to cover before we start the public hearing? Anything else the applicant wants to present? Uh, 
No, we just like to summarize that we understand that additional plans need to be developed and more details uh, need to be submitted, particularly related to construction. Uh, we have heard that there are concerns and we will be developing these plans with the neighborhood concerns in mind. We plan to reach out to the Fall Creek School to understand uh, what their concerns might be and we'll continue to work with the board to identify potential impacts uh, related to the environmental review, including uh, soil contamination, traffic views from the neighborhood and any potential disruptions during construction. And we'll listen and provide more information as needed to clarify and address concerns. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, with that, I think I'm gonna push board comment off for a bit and i'm going to ask if there is a motion to open public hearing i see emily move is there a second i see mitch second all in favor of opening public hearing and i believe i saw everyone's hand uh so public hearing is now open uh lisa are there any members of the public wishing to speak? There are three people wishing to speak there, you know, or there are four, but three showed up. I will call on them in alphabetical order. And then with the remaining time, we can read the many, many comments at which were requested to be read into the record. So the first speaker is Elon Greenfield. Unmute. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Okay. I did want to also be able to see you. <laughs> okay. My name is Ilan, and I'm a lifelong resident of Ithaca. I was shocked to hear of the Auden 2 proposal on this specific land due to the well-known decades-long issue of the high levels of contamination from lead and other chemical substances. My safety, environmental, and parking concerns are echoed by other speakers. I will be focusing on the neighborhood. Looking at the attached photos of the neighborhood that I sent today, Auden 2 does not fit. It does not even fit with Auden 1. This is a neighborhood of single and small multifamily homes, which are majority owner occupied. There is an elementary school 225 feet away from the proposed Auden 2, and it would be next to one of the state's largest waterfalls. You may only be looking at the design and appearance of the proposed building, but please do not pretend that Auden 2 will be built in the middle of nowhere in a vacuum. Auden 2 would be so intimately integrated into a densely populated residential neighborhood that the hundreds of immediately surrounding residents and school children must be taken into consideration as well. Ithaca is where we live, raise our families, and invest in more than just monetarily. Ithaca is Ithaca because of neighborhoods like Fall Creek. Forcing an out of place block long building hovering over us with bright exterior lights pointing at our homes is neither welcoming nor welcome. Auden 2 will completely alter the neighborhood that we live in and are invested in every day of every month. The view from the neighborhood will be nothing but Auden 2, regardless of what the designers say. Please see my photos for reference. This building does not suit the area and the board must consider more than permits and zoning. In addition to the residents and schools feet away, you might also wanna consider the placement of Auden 2, a student housing building in relation to the bar, the Fall Creek House on the corner of Lake and Lincoln. Before COVID, we would regularly make noise complaints on nights when the college kids would walk down from Cornell to the bar. Without a hills walk in their way, the bar will likely become a nightly noise complaint as it becomes the 211 newly added college students bar of convenience. Furthermore, add this to an already accident prone intersection and blind spot riddled hill, as well as a gorge waterfall where multiple deaths occur each year, typically from college age people falling or consider the sound disruption to the learning of roughly 250 elementary school students and the potentially highly polluted dust and debris falling on their playground, blowing in through their classroom windows, as well as into our homes and gardens. And let's not forget, even though it was left out of the application, the nearly 1400 high school students, <laughs> just 800 feet away, who will also be affected by the rerouting of school buses, traffic, the added noise and pollution, meaning that one third of all Ithaca City School District children 
Garden will be affected and within 800 feet of Auden Tude, which plans on beginning construction at the start of the 2022 school year. As a parent and a local resident, I am very concerned. As you move forward, please consider all aspects of this project as it will affect thousands of people on a daily basis. Auden Tude should not be built on the land located at 261 Lake Street. That's Thank you very much. Right. Well, I said alphabetical order, but then I skipped the first person, um, uh, which now it's uh, next speaker is Lillian Fan. All right. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. You can. Great. Thank you. All right. So my family and I live within a couple hundred feet of the project, and there has been little consideration for how the building will impact residents and school children. At January's meeting, only Mitch Glass and Emily Petrina considered how it will look in reality versus the drawings presented from strategic vantage points and what it will look like to the community. There is no way this building will blend into the area. Regardless of the building materials, the building will dominate every view. I drive up and down Gun Hill daily, and this project will create even more hazards on the blind curve. The fire lane will be used for deliveries, ride shares, and trash pickup. It is already difficult to see and react to cars waiting to turn onto Lincoln Street, and it can only be worse with cars and trash trucks pulling away from the curb, especially now knowing that the loading zone will be where cars wait to turn onto Lincoln, which is still at the bottom of the slope. The parking lot looks three quarters full every time I drive by, and with no additional parking, overflow will end up on already crowded residential streets. Students may not drive to campus because it's inconvenient and expensive, but that doesn't mean they won't have cars. Road noises will be louder with the removal of a vegetative hill that is home to wildlife, not to mention the sounds of 211 people where there are none. We can hear the students at Auden One now and they are much further away. More pressing are the environmental concerns. The environmental report states it cannot be assumed that the limited available data are representative of subsurface conditions in areas not sampled. Given the history of the land, the entire site should undergo a thorough exam. Only two out of the five boreholes tested are under the building footprint, and the northern boundary that was included in the remediation maps was not tested. Why are we to accept that this is sufficient when the 2017 DEC report says the site is safe if undisturbed and that contaminants were distributed at random? If the impetus for pushing this project through is in the name of creating affordable housing, this will not be affordable, and it may only offer temporary relief at the expense of the community's health and well-being. By fall, Cornell's North Campus expansion will add 800 beds for sophomore students that are currently not living on campus, theoretically freeing up One existing minute. rentals. The burden of student housing should not fall only on the shoulders of residents while lining the pockets of developers. And with all due respect, this board has the power to change the landscape and the lives of residents for decades to come. Such stewardship comes with a responsibility to the community served, and the board should be doing their due diligence to critically examine more than what is presented in drawings. The reality is that this proposed building may fit on the land, but it doesn't fit in any other way. At minimum, a moratorium on the proposal should be put in place until the results of a full environmental study and a health impact assessment are presented to the public. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, and thus far this project has been hidden under dark clouds. Thank you for your time. Right, Thank next, you. Next speaker is Veronica Pillar. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, my name is Veronica Pillar. I live at 1108 North Aurora Street, which is just uh, two blocks from this project. I'm also the Tompkins County legislator representing this district, which doesn't have anything to do directly with this, but because of it, um, you know, I've been hearing from a small handful of constituents about their concerns about this project. Um, I'll try to keep it short because I'm kind of echoing what Elon and Lillian said, um, but Three concern points are the site contamination because of the gun factory, the traffic implications, at least during construction, and um, just as Lillian mentioned, the fact that this is um, another example of like the gentrification and related effects coming from student housing getting pushed down into the city um, as opposed to say more dorms, which I'm all about. So, in order, the environmental effects have been covered, but I just wanna say one thing that came up in, I think you know that the site has been going through cycles of like testing and clearing and testing again and um, being declared safe and not in different ways. And one thing that came out of that was that the contaminants have been like over time migrating downhill because it, things fall down with gravity and this has been seen here. So I wanna be sure that that's taken into account when reviewing the 
contaminant results. Um, that like a snapshot in time is not enough because of the history of this site. Um, about the traffic, I drive through that block of Lincoln Street right in front of the place most days, drive or walk, and it's, I don't know when all you check it out or your experience with it, but it's essentially a one lane road most of the time, um, just because there's parking on both sides and you can't really get two cars passed at once, or at least people aren't willing to. And so that causes strange backups at intersections. So um, I'm not, I don't think that's a great priority to have the city, you know, super car friendly. I'd love it to see be more like pedestrian friendly and bus friendly, but at least um, when thinking long-term, but at least during the construction itself, I'd anticipate the construction itself, like impacting that traffic flow in a way that like, there's not really capacity to absorb more obstruction um, or more traffic flowing through. One minute. Yeah, thanks. Um, and finally, just, I'm not, I'd actually love in general to see more housing built in Fall Creek. I think like, you know, the neighborhood is wonderful as stated, but I think it do, does need to change. The density needs to increase. We need like to get, you know, more people who like work and use services in the city able to live here. But this project isn't that. Like everyone loves affordable housing and this project isn't that. This is like um, pushing a population that Cornell has the resources to support on its own land down um, toward the center of the city. And I do not think this is really gonna help our housing situation as a whole. Thank you very much. Next is Simon Wheeler. Hi, good evening. Um, my apologies if I wasn't muted earlier when I was made, made rude comments. Um, and my video's not up. Um, I don't know why. Okay, start video. Okay, um, uh, two issues. Uh, the existing street drain, can you, heal, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. The existing street drainage on Lake Street above East Lincoln and East Falls Streets results in a large proportion of the surface runoff from the proposed Auden 2 building site and adjacent downhill city property to the north, running north on Lake Street to East Falls and then to, all the way to Tioga Street on East Falls. I'm concerned that uh, both during and after construction, the Auden 2 project will result in increased surface water runoff. During construction, especially, I would su suspect that the runoff will carry a heavy sediment load as the entire site is elevated above Lake Street. Runoff from the city of Ithaca property north of the Auden 2 site already deposits a significant amount of sediment onto East Falls Street. The, current, the poor current street drainage is now even more important as the newly released draft FEMA Region 2 flood map shows that the one in 500 year flood zone now extends to the intersection of East Falls and Aurora Streets. I would ask that the Lake, Lake Street storm drainage be rebuilt to capture all the surface runoff uphill of Lake Street into the drains on Lake Street. This might require regrading Lake Street along the length of the project and north of Lincoln Street as none of the drains on Lake Street currently catch much water due to grading irregularities in the street surface. The Auden 2 project will worsen flood risk in the streets below unless the street drainage is corrected. Uh, second issue, there is a DEC monitoring well in what is labeled as the extension of East Lincoln Street. Um, has the New York NYS DEC been consulted about possible interference with this groundwater monitoring well labeled MW-7 in NYS DEC documents? Uh, it's located in what's labeled as the East Lincoln Street Extension, immediately north of the proposed Auden 2 site. Um, that well is used as a baseline sampling point prior to proposed work at the former factory site, and it's also described as being used for sampling at the end of a groundwater treatment plan to promote biodegradation of chlorinated uh, VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds, present in the bedrock at the former factory site that is uphill of the Auden parking lot. I feel it is important to consult with the NYS DEC about these the possible disturbance to that monitoring well. It is it's extremely close to the proposed Auden 2 site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there right. any other, go oh, please. That concludes the speakers who have signed up to speak. I have, that was about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of um, uh, comments to be read into the record. Uh, 
on you. Can you time me so that I don't go off more than three minutes on any comment? Just do. As I can and we'll do. You want to go to 30 minutes, Rob? Is that what you Yeah, saying? we'll go to 30 minutes. I have that at stopping somewhere around 915. 915. Okay. So we'll take it to 915, finish right. that three minute comment, and we'll okay. see if we're done. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to read. The, they're in no particular order. I'm just going to tell you who wrote them and read well, them. Well, they are kind of in the order received, but okay. with right. a few exceptions. All right. All right. First one is from Amalia Weinberg. Uh, Ithaca Falls is an exhilarating and restorative site where people from the neighborhood and visitors find respite from civilization. I implore you not to let a massive ugly building encroach on one of the most beautiful natural areas in our state. Second comment from Elizabeth Holmes of 901 North Tioga Street. I am opposed to any development on the site at the base of Gun Hill, which provides a small area of green space and habitat for birds and animals within the city. The loss of those woods will further accelerate the rapid decline in bird population that has already that is already happening here and across the country. Further, I am opposed because of the impact on the Fall Creek neighborhood. With regard to traffic, that end of Lincoln Street is already functionally a one-way street because of the many cars parked by residents who have no driveways. It will be nearly impossible at times if we have an additional 200 or so residents using it to access these proposed apartments. Lake Street is also crowded currently with people visiting the falls and sometimes stopping their cars on the bridge to take a look. We don't need more traffic there either. Aside from traffic concerns, I am not enthusiastic about A, adding population density to our neighborhood and B, increasing the proportion of students in the area. I think it's fair to assume that most occupants will be students who by definition are transient and will alter the character of the neighborhood. This is from Mary Jane McKibben of 312 East Fall Street. I'm writing as a resident of 312 East Falls Street concerned about the proposed Auden 2 project at 261 Lake Street. As someone who lives in the first block of Fall Street nearest the waterfall on Lake Street, I am specifically worried about its impact upon an already crowded traffic pattern as well as the stress on limited neighborhood parking. Lincoln Street is used as a main thoroughfare for drivers to reach 13 from Lake Street. Because it is so busy, drivers coming on Lake Street from the north frequently choose Fall Street instead as an easier option. The two streets become particularly busy at drop-off and pick-up times at the Ithaca High School and DeWitt Middle Schools on Lake Street, as well as Fall Street Creek Elementary School. Excuse me. The Ithaca Falls brings a steady stream of students and visitors throughout the year who park on East Fall Street as well as Lincoln Street. <laughs> Parking on our, both sides of the street can reduce each street to a single lane road where cars will even stop and let each other go by. TCAT uses both sides as well. <coughs> I note that the Auden plan does not include additional parking spaces for the anticipated 211 new occupants. Those bringing cars to school may opt to use Lincoln and Fall Street instead, which could make a crowded situation worse. My neighbor and I share a driveway and we take turns on a weekly basis using it. So every other week, each of us must find space on the street. I'm in favor of some kind of residential parking sticker permit that at a minimum limits overnight street parking to residents. This note doesn't address the environmental impact of the project on the Ithaca Falls natural area, which has recently undergone a, a lead remediation effort only to have them undone by erosion due to record rainfalls. I would also say that having student housing so close to the falls will present new pressures on an already troubled site. And you just brought me cough drops. So that's <laughs> and I'm going to take one. One uh, minute. <laughs> one, okay. uh, this is from Simon Wheeler. So he just yeah. spoke. Yes, so he, he asked to speak in right. person instead of uh, reading. I will not read that one. Okay. This one is from Liddy Coyle. I asked the city to put a moratorium on the Auden 2 project and um, among the many areas requested by other residents, examine the impact of this project environmentally. It seems that there are areas of the property in which soil has not been fully deeply tested for contamination. Has the planning and development board members examined the testing results in de detail? Additionally, it seems that a traffic study on Lake Street 
area by East Fall Street and Lincoln Street for volume parking capacity is in order since there are potentially over 200 cars added to the neighborhood, but zero parking spaces added. While the proposal indicated a shared use of the lot at Auden 1, that lot is parked at near capacity on a daily basis. If even half the residents have cars at Auden 2, the Fall Creek area will have hazardous conditions on the two-way street that has become impassable for two cars when vehicles are parked on one side. This is from Frederick Bleach. Doesn't give an address. As a resident of Lincoln Street for over 25 years and employee at Cornell, I passed by the proposed site frequently, both on foot and by car. The east end of Lincoln Street is already overly congested with cars and the T intersection with Lake Street dangerous, is dangerous because of slopes, visibility and amount of traffic. The large residential building there would significantly increase the traffic in this already congested area. The notion that that could be built without parking as if that would stop residents from having cars is ludicrous. Those cars would just end up further congesting the area and pedestrians would have to cross Lake Street to get to connecting sidewalks at a place with poor visibility and heavy traffic. Crossing Lincoln at the intersection, one has to be extremely ca cautious. Crossing Lake at any other than a quiet time is risky. There's good reasons there's no crosswalk there, but lower down on Fall Creek, or Fall Street. The wooded slope there provides a small measure of calming, but more importantly, it holds the decades of contaminated soil in place undisturbed. It also provides a home for populations of deer and other animals and more or less natural framing of the falls, one of the great attractions of Ithaca. The removal of the former house by the Lake Street Bridge was a good step enhancing the area of the falls, but one that could be dramatically undone by this development. Many of us on first hearing of this project assumed it would be either on the old gun factory site or replacing all or part of the existing apartment parking lot above the proposed site. Either of those would have the same problems of congestion, but they would at least preserve the natural setting around the entrance of the falls and shift some of the hazard away from the busy intersection at the bottom of the hill. I urge the board to reject this and any proposal for developing the slope, slope site to protect public safety and the natural and historic site. <coughs> this is from Paul Doug. My daughter, and her husband and granddaughter reside on East Falls, about four houses from the falls. She's age two and will attend grade school there soon. I am opposed to the apartment complex, lead poisoning is serious business and this complex will inev inevitably upset the existing lead. Traffic is already heavy on Fall Street, especially since it is difficult for two-way traffic. Cars parked on both sides of the street. The complex will significantly increase the density in the vicinity of the school. Many children walk to that school and the increased traffic is not in their best interest. <coughs> the complex is great geared to Cornell students. Cornell owns an enormous amount of property to the east. It's their responsibility to provide land for housing that does not degrade the quality of life for non-Cornell residents. Upsetting this natural area will also degrade the wildlife and birds in the area. Finally, their falls is among the most popular. The falls is among the most popular tourist attractions in Ithaca. Folks already have nowhere to park. The complex will help will help spoil the falls experience. This is from Vilma Santiago Irzari. This might okay. Um, I've lived on Lincoln Street since 1995 and. Our Cornell University faculty have used the route up Lake Street to walk or drive to work practically on a daily basis. The wooden site <coughs> around Ithaca Falls is among our Fall Creek neighborhood's attractions, both for residents and visitors. It is a place of respite for us and a prime tourist destination. To think that anyone would even consider despoiling it and building student housing cheek by jowl to our falls is to put it mildly preposterous. Moreover, these, over these decades, I have witnessed how Fall Creek has been affected by increasing traffic because of the congestion in other areas of the city. Lincoln Street in particular has fast become a preferred shortcut from the local flats to the heights. The street became so parked up that particularly at its Eastern end where I live, it has become an obstacle course that requires dangerous dodging maneuvers to navigate a narrow street in which one is often passing at a hair's breadth distance. This is compounded by visi reduced visibility in the approach to Lake Street and the intersection itself. Backing out of our driveway, 
has likewise become perilous and even impossible as people park their vehicles so close to it that they obstruct our sight lines and even block us in completely, which has also increased increasingly occurred, especially as compared to our earlier years here. I've observed as well how <coughs> street play among the neighborhood's children has gone down, not surprisingly given the increased parking and perilous street conditions for walking, biking, and skating. Climate change and environmental conditions must be considered. When I first moved here, we barely had any need for much more than a fan in summer evenings. Over the years, increasing summer heat pushed us first to air conditioners in the bedroom and home office and a couple of years ago to central air conditioning, increasingly more visible among our neighbors as well. Rather than eliminating foliage by obliterating a calming spot of green in our neighborhood, the city should be doing its utmost to protect it. It is bad to live close to the contaminated Ithaca gun factory site. Do not compound this by eliminating Ithaca Falls natural frame that would be hemmed in by this unnecessary construction of student housing, which will harm the neighborhood and those who benefit will go to line the pockets of the developers. Noise and the potential despoiling of the falls area by immature student behavior will by just by a handful should also be of great concern. These and, for these and other reasons are exposed in the petition that was circulated on change.org, which I have signed and is why I'm opposing this shift and urge you to reject it in no uncertain terms. <coughs> Excuse me. This is from Margarita Fabrizio. Hello, thank you for reading this into the record. Um, <clears throat> in the late 1980s, to protect Ithaca Falls from a proposed hydropower development, Citizens worked together to get a special protective designation in place for Ithaca Falls upstream to BB Lake Dam. It's called the New York State Wild Scenic and Recreational River Des um, Designation. This was an enormous effort over 1.5 years that culminated in the special protected status for the lower part of the falls. The city has the official map of the entire protected zone, which encompasses Ithaca Falls and runs up University to, I believe, the middle of the road all the way to BB Lake Dam. I believe the proposed development site is in the protected zone. This status was conveyed by power of the state legislature after the bill was introduced into the legislature by then assembly member Marty Luster. It subjects any proposed development in this protected zone to additional restriction and reviews which the city is obligated to by law to uphold. The city rather than the DEC is the designated reviewer of projects in this zone though those these were unusual powers given to the city that could at any time be revoked by DEC if they were to determine the city did not uphold the intention and letter of the law. I believe there have been numerous instances over the years when the city was obliged to do a special review of various projects in this zone. I think numerous bridges and bridge related projects, but as far as I know, the city has never met its legal requirement to do so. It must for this proposal. The city of Ithaca has an obligation to know if and how this legislation is relevant to this proposal. If development of the site this, of this size on that site would be allowed in all, at all because of the designation, a public meeting with the DC is warranted before any additional steps toward the development are undertaken. <clears throat> and then there's um, um, links to the designation on the DC website. All right, this is from. Nina T. Chowpricho. <clears throat> I've lived for, in Fall Creek for nine years, a few blocks from the base of Gun Hill. I have multiple concern about Auden's proposed four-story, 211-bedroom apartment building proposed for the base of Gun Hill. The proposed apartment building feels very out of character for the neighborhood, which is mostly houses and right next to the Ithaca Falls natural area, a scenic respite spot that is popular with both locals and tourists. The proposed development seems too large scale to be right on the edge of the Fall Creek neighborhood. I moved to this area of Fall Creek because it is a quiet, is it a quiet residential area. I am concerned about the noise of adding so many additional student residents right on the edge of a generally quiet Fall Creek neighborhood. I worry that adding 71 apartments in the proposed space would significantly increase, increase vehicular traffic at the base of Gun Hill. The parking plan seems inadequate. I have heard that Auden is asking for a zoning variance and repainting lines on its existing parking lot to create 25, 20 to 25 additional parking spots for the 211 additional people. 
it seems unreasonable for the design team to assume that most residents will not have cars, even that its current parking lot appears to be 75% full for its current 279 residents. I worry about the effects of this project on stormwater drainage in the area, since water runoff is already problematic down, down the hill. Adding more impervious surface seems likely to worsen runoff problems in the area. I am sad that this project will result in the loss of green space near Ithaca Falls, green space that provides scenic beauty next to the Falls Park area, habitat for wildlife, a sledding hill for local children, and sound buffer in the area. I hope that the foreign investment firm and real estate developer DMG Investments, whose mission is to pursue, strate quote, pursue strategic opportunities, delivering superior results to investors, will not be allowed to ruin the character of Ithaca's historic Fall Creek neighborhood and the proposed monstrosity of a housing development. All right, it looks like we have maybe two more. Okay, this is from Virginia. Dolgast. I understand the need to accommodate the growing student population in Ithaca and address the housing shortage. However, the planned project will have a disproportionately negative impact on the surrounding neighborhood. It is on the edge of a residential area where there is frequent foot traffic by children and families. We often walk to Ithaca Falls with our children and older children walk there together with their friends. This entails crossing an already busy street. The planned project is very close to Fall Creek elementary where children of all ages hang out on the playground during afternoons and weekends. The development will generate additional traffic, <clears throat> will increase noise pollution and danger for pedestrians. It feels out of character for the neighborhood, which is primarily single family or duplex homes. It is on the edge of a natural area visited by residents and tourists and would generate additional noise and possibly litter. Finally, my 11 year old daughter is quite upset when I told her they would build on top of her favorite winter sledding hill. That hill is a Fall Creek institution and would be a huge loss to pave it over. <clears throat> this is from Deborah Justice. I live on 2nd Street and strongly oppose this project. Ithaca Falls is an amazing natural gem. It should be surrounded by trees and not a high rise apartment building. People like living in Fall Creek because it is quaint and walkable. Increasing traffic and disturbing lead contaminated soil will not add to the neighborhood. I am planning for my young son to attend Fall Creek Elementary, but I would change that plan if I felt traffic, an ugly looming building and environmental considerations impact the school. This apartment building is unnecessary and serves to advance corporate greed, not the local quality of life. <clears throat> Should I continue? More. Uh, how many do we have left? I mean, hmm. I have us with a couple, you know, a couple minutes, potential, potential one or two more of these. Let's say there's probably five or six minutes of reading left. You could just finish. Yeah, let's just finish. If we're that close, okay. let's, let's, oh, let's finish. Maybe not. Maybe oh. not. Might be a little bit more. <clears throat> we'll see. <clears throat> All right. This is from Tracy Robbins of East Lincoln Street. As a mother of a kindergarten attending, kindergartner attending Fall Creek Elementary School and as a staff member of Ithaca City School District and Fall Creek Elementary School, I'm gravely concerned about this project moving forward without regard to the safety and well-being of Fall Creek residents and students. On page four of the phase two subsurface investigation report for student living 261 Lake Street, Ithaca, I would note that in paragraph two, section 2.1, under the heading limitations, the report very clearly states in quotes, it cannot be assumed that the limited data available are representative of subsurface conditions in areas not sampled. Additionally, when samples were collected in 2021 from the northern half of the property, levels were nearly high enough for remediation. I would like to request an assessment be done for the entire project area to ensure the safety of Fall Creek residents and school children attending Fall Creek Elementary School to guarantee that there will be no health hazards associated with disturbing the soil and from runoff both during construction and thereafter. <clears throat> I am a resident of East Lincoln Street. I would like to request that a traffic study be conducted before this project proceeds. I would like to specify that the study reflect the implications of the proposed fire lane in regard to oncoming traffic from the blind curve on the northern end of the project. The Lake Street Lincoln Street intersection is a high traffic corner with many collisions. Fall Creek is an amazing neighborhood. 
I work really hard to be able to live in this neighborhood and raise my son here. Auden too will change the face of our neighborhood forever. It is the duty of our city representatives, including the planning board to work for the betterment of our city, particularly when it comes to development. This project does nothing to improve our city and will have an adverse effect on our community when there is a high density, more traffic, more noise, toxic construction, and less green space directly adjacent to one of the most renowned natural features in New York State. I live directly across from the project site on East Lincoln Street in a registered historic landmark, the Ezra Cornell's Pottery House. We are so lucky to have such treasures in the city, but with each new development project and each new high rise and more and more unattainable housing monstrosities, we are diminishing the character and quality of life that we have come to know and love. There are so many reasons why this project should not move forward. I request the city put a moratorium on this project to ensure the safety of the neighborhood at the very least. Additionally, I would like to request that if this project were to move forward, consideration be made for, at a minimum, proper external building materials that would absorb the sound of traffic as vegetation would. I would like to request that the exterior lighting have a minimal impact on nearby residential properties as these lights will shine directly into my windows. I'm gonna just see one, two. You have over a dozen comments left. A dozen comments. Yeah, probably to be read. And then there are there are many more that were not included to be read. So Okay, I think that's where we call it then. Uh, <laughs> what we'll do is we will not move to close public hearing. We will table public hearing until the next time we meet where we will pick it up uh, with the remainder of those comments. Okay. Um, since there's still comments, I don't necessarily know that we need to do a reaction to public hearing since it's still happening it's customary to give the applicant a chance to sort of speak to what they've heard um if the applicant wanted to do that very briefly that would be fine um but there, there will be more next month uh the one thing that we did want to say is that we have engaged a traffic engineer and will be supplying a traffic analysis Great. and and then the owner is working with the environmental consultant partner uh, to review some of the comments that have been made and, and uh, respond to those. We'll, we'll get that in writing. Great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, and I'll say to staff that I think I and possibly other members of the board will at some point want some guard guidance from staff uh, on the environmental front, because it does seem like there's a lot here to just think about and make sure we're taking seriously. I think probably that should be one of the first things we deal with um, and see if we need any more additional information. Great. So that looks like that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I did just want to say, because it was in several letters, I just wanted to say something about this, um, the request for a moratorium by the planning board on this project, just for people's information, the planning board cannot do a moratorium on one project. The applicant has a right to apply for this approval and the planning board can, can consider it and do an environmental review, but they cannot do a moratorium on one project, although they have to go through the process of site plan review and environmental review to its conclusion. Good. Um, didn't seem like there was a lot of new information this month, so I don't necessarily know that we're looking for board feedback from what we've seen. Is that is that a fair summary? Seems like we were mostly retreading information to make sure we got through it with the public hearing. We looked at a few views. We're going to look at new and better views next time. Uh, unless there's a, a need from anybody here to, to sort of weigh in or have a question or comment, uh, and now is the time, I think we might call it for this project today. I'm seeing some nods. All right. So I think that's it. I very Mitch much appreciate your time. Up, sorry. Oh, I'm about, sorry, Mitch. I had a question. Yeah, please. Um, just I want to understand uh, the comp plan uh, in relationship to this uh, site, because I went and looked at the comp plan, and it seems that the future land use for this site is denoted as environmentally sensitive, um, not as medium density residential. So I'm, I'm confused as to the zoning designation and to the comp plan um, in congruity here. Can you explain that, somebody? Maybe next time? I, I yeah, we'll provide that. a memo with clarification on that. Thanks for that, Mitch. Uh, anybody else? 
All right. Okay. So thank now... you for your time this evening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a good evening. Good night. All right. That brings us to Valentine Place. <clears throat> ask the you could ask the applicant to do extremely brief presentation or i think no. that would be appropriate um i will let them in maybe a break rob like two minutes like just two minutes the strats we, it's almost three and a half hours now yeah i hate it yeah sure all right just two minutes all right well, we're gonna we're gonna take three minutes three. and uh, and and we'll see each other here at 9 24. Okay. You guys hear me? I hear you. Hmm. Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Yeah, I can. We can hear you, Sean. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't hear you until just now. So. Uh, yeah, I was on mute. Let's see here. Um, do I have to do anything to share my screen? When it's my turn, or it just automatically goes up. You can do it when you're ready. <clears throat> we could we also uh, let Iris Ma into the room. But um, Rob may have some comments for you on the length of your presentation. Very possible. <laughs> do you is Frank Santelli with you? Yes. If board members could turn on their cameras when they get back, just so I know that we're all here. That's special. Can she see herself? Yes, just like I can see. Oh, I'm not on mute, by the way. I see a quorum and then a little bit. So I think we're we're good to get going. Uh, if the applicant would please introduce yourself take it away i will say that it is late and brevity is appreciated okay we'll be, we'll be sort of rapid fire here so uh let's see here why don't i just uh, are you able to see my screen not yet let's see uh so i have to do something here to share uh where's the share at the bottom of the screen yeah, yeah. i see it
Is that working? There you go. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so I'm Catherine Wolf, uh, Trowbridge Wolf Michaels Landscape Architects, and I am joined this evening by uh, Carolyn O'Donnell and Iris Ma of Coda Architecture, uh, as well as Sean Daniels, architect. Uh, and I believe uh, Frank Santelli from TG Miller is also here with us. Uh, so we have, um, we are going to share the um, a presentation uh, with a few updates from what we presented. Uh, there's not a lot of change since the sketch plan. So I'm going to kind of move really quickly through the material that um, we've seen before. And Caroline will have, um, we'll spend a little more time on the new information. Um, so just to remind you, uh, this is a 30 unit apartment complex uh, with a ground floor leasing office. And we are seeking two variances, one for off street parking uh, and one for the minimum lot size. Uh, the project is located at the end of Valentine Place, uh, just off of State Street. Uh, it's surrounded on two sides by College Town, the College Town Terrace Apartments, and is be de being developed by the same developer group. Uh, this is a survey of the existing site condition. Uh, the existing buildings on site will be demolished. The existing asphalt and parking uh, will be demolished, and there will be no new parking built. Um, the existing College Town Terrace has um, uh, excess unused parking, and so parking will be offered there uh, for tenants of the new building. Uh, and as well, the developer operates a private shuttle from College Town Terrace, which will also uh, serve this facility. Uh, here is the site plan. Um, there is uh, there's an entry plaza on the north side uh, with some uh, bike racks, outdoor bench, another uh, loading service area on the south uh, where the dumpsters are. The balance of the site is uh, planted uh, extensively, uh, really as sort of an extension of the existing extensive uh, plantings at College Town Terrace. Uh, Caroline? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, given the, the late hour, I will uh, skim quickly over material that, that was presented last time. So here you can see the views, um, the legend on the left, uh, the top row being the views from State Street, uh, looking down Valentine and Valentine itself. Number four in the middle is the, the kind of uh, unfolded uh, street elevation. And the bottom row is the view uh, from, from the site looking outwards towards uh, the larger buildings at College Town Terrace. Uh, we can go to the next page um, because this is where we've photoshopped in the, um, the building into the site. So the same photo looking from State Street on the top, looking from State Street down Valentine. You can just make it out there, the kind of gold color uh, sawtooth roof and the same unfolded uh, street view with the project now in there. Um, and if you go to the next page, um, you'll see a little bit more detailed elevation that was not presented last time, both the front and the back. So you'll remember last time I said the sawtooth, uh, if you go back, yeah, thanks. The sawtooth parapet references the pitched roof of the adjacent house and houses and breaks up the roof line. The Front facade contains modules of three different depths to create shadow lines that further articulate the facade and the cantilevered screen, which is on the left there with a little heart uh, and below that separates um, public from private and provides additional privacy for the residents. So that's the front facade that we concentrated on the last time. Here we're also seeing the back facade, which um, resonates with the front facade in a more understated way. Um, instead of changing the depths, literally here, we're using different colors, uh, two different tones and a more modest uh, sawtooth profile. And then if you go to the next one, you'll see the same story on the long facades. Uh, so the, also the two tone color scheme that is still in development for the exact colors, but you can see a range of kind of uh, honey, honey kind of hues um, in, in two different tones. Uh, so those exact colors are still in development, but you can see uh, a kind of progress on the on the side facades here and go to the next slide. Um, you saw that last time. This is a daytime view in progress, of course, and then the nighttime view. Uh, and last time we talked about the, um, the material having a kind of uh, 
transparent quality that allows um, various kinds of uh, light qualities to come from behind. So if you go to the next slide, we can talk a bit more about materials. Um, these are some reference images. So the, the cladding material in the front is a perforated corrugated metal. So on the left, you can see the kind of effect that would create from looking from the inside out. And then on the right, top right, you can see the kind of effect we're looking for um, from the outside in when it is lit from behind or when there is um, sky behind. And then at the bottom, uh, the kind of range of colors that we're looking at in these kind of honey tones. And finally, some mock-ups uh, that are quite exciting. Um, the two on the left um, are, are actual physical mock-ups and the one on the right is still in a, a digital version, but um, being, being processed. Um, and you can see, obviously, uh, it's a rain screen facade with a corrugated um, metal that's perforated. And the perforation pattern is, of course, um, and we should have presented last Monday, if that was had been possible on Valentine's Day. Um, but you'll have to accept our delayed uh, Happy Valentine. Um, so the, the facade um, pattern references, of course, the name of the street, which is Valentine Place. Uh, I think that's all we have for you, apart from a little bit more uh, detail, so we can go back to Catherine for the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yes, and then just um, in conclusion, uh, I mean, we're happy to answer any questions, but this was just a summary of uh, our schedule. Uh, so we're looking to declare lead agency this evening. Uh, we are planning on a public hearing next month for the project, uh, followed by the review of the seeker in April uh, and so forth. So we would be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just gonna go around the board and get quick reactions to what we've seen. Uh, Daniel, can I start with you? Um, I think this is a this is a really great project. Um, I really appreciate the attention to detail and materiality. Um, I, I, I really like the bridge between um, the existing single family homes and the College Town Terrace. I, I, I do think it softens that up. Um, kudos on the details. This is a really, you know, so far, so, so great. Um, yeah, I I think this would be a really great addition to this uh, to this part of town. Thank you, Elizabeth. I agree with uh, Daniel. It looks great. Thanks, Garrick. The same way, Emily. I'm glad to see the other elevations. I think last time we just saw the um, the west front facade. So. Um, it's great to see that the other facades have as much attention to them and, and thoughtful materials. And I think the shared parking is a win. And um, yeah, looks great so far. Thank you. Mitch. Uh, same comments as last time. Love it. For myself, I, I'll say that it has potential to be a really great project. Uh, this is exactly the part of town where we want to be building um, you know, student housing. This seems like a sensitive way to do that. I uh, really appreciate the context view that you're showing now at the bottom of that, where we can see the street and the building heights and where that looks in the streetscape. Super helpful. Very, very helpful. Um, and I'm excited to see this project move forward. Um, anything else before we, we, we let these folks go? Just... Yeah, no, sorry, just declaration of lead agency. I think we know. Oh, that. yeah, we have yeah. an action. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. So there is a resolution, the green resolution in your packet that says proposed resolution declaration of lead agency. Is there a proposal for declaring lead agents or is, it, is there a motion for declaring lead agents on this project? I see Elizabeth move. Is there a second? I see Emily second. Um, yeah, I should do a roll call vote on this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go around the room. Daniel, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Elizabeth, how do you vote? Yes. Garrick, how do you vote? Yes. Emily, how do you vote? Yes. Mitch, how do you vote? Yes. I also vote yes. You have a lead agent, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you next month. See you next month. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nikki. I, I totally would have just ushered them away it's late <laughs>
Did Garrick vote? He did. I think Elizabeth was. Oh, yeah, I got to recuse myself. Oh. It's the next one. Yep. Can you just so, yeah. why, Elizabeth? Yeah. What's that? Could you just state why you're recusing yourself? Yes, I'm, I'm in the process. Um, so I am a project manager for facilities at um, Cornell and a colleague of Mike Stewart, who's going to be presenting. And um, I am recusing myself from any Cornell projects that come through as they're all from my department. All right. Hi, Bye, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we'll grab you when we're done and uh, and hope to see you for the zoning appeals here in a little while. Right. Good luck. Thank oh, you, you got a break, Elizabeth. <laughs> and uh, Leslie, did you want to start? All right, I'll, I'll share my nice wide deck here. And Are you all ready for us to begin? Yes, please introduce yourself, take it away. Great, thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Leslie Schill, Director of Campus Planning at Cornell. Pleased to be here tonight to talk to you about the Sprint Football Locker Room. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mike Stewart, who will go first. We will move as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. I know it's been a really long night, so we will go very fast. Uh, so our, the intent of our project is to create a home for the sprint football program. Uh, it's a varsity sport, it's football. And hold, hold on one second. Marin, can you stop washing the dishes, honey? Stop washing the dishes, please. <laughs> Thanks. Mike, can you go to um, to the slide presentation mode so everybody can see a full screen? That would sure. Be Thank you. Uh, here, hold on. Of course, right now, the Zoom controls are blocking my ability to do that. Oh, that's this not. <laughs> yeah, I literally cannot click on that. Stop because... screen sharing for a moment and then switch it out. Okay, here we go. Sounds like you've done this before. All right. Uh, sorry. This is. Give me 30 seconds. Aaron. Okay, here we go. I think I have it. Slideshow from beginning. Here we go. All right, now I can share. Okay, how's that? Looks good. Oh, thank God. All right. That was easy. Uh, so basically due to Title IX considerations, um, we had to uh, relocate our sprint football program out of their current space um, to create some parity closer to Shulkoff Field. And we're looking to create a new home for them. Um, this space, uh, we'll go over the siting later. It's uh, immediately east of the field and south of the official band center. We did look exhaustively in adjacent buildings, and this truly was the, uh, the best solution that we could come up with. Um, so the, the program is locker rooms for the full team. It's about 50 players. There is also a plan to have uh, videos, uh, large video screens on the walls inside the locker room for viewing footage. Uh, there's a room for uh, physical therapy and taping. And there are shower facilities, eight showers, two toilets, three urinals, two sinks. Uh, as outlined in the program, we have all electric utilities, air source heat pumps, LED lights, um, and electric hot water heating. And the, the footprint is pro approximately 68 by 27. It's a modular building, comes in two modules, sits on about 30 inch high concrete piers, um, comes in on two trucks, and they have a device that lowers it, moves it into place and lowers it in on the foundations. Um, the, I won't read how many windows it has, that's in the elevation. Uh, it also has a very vibrant color scheme. Um, the materiality of it is uh, to, and also the aesthetics are kind of contemporary. 
um, in response to the official band center, which also has vertical, um, vertical ridged metal siding. And um, also it has an ADA ramp and stairs that have a clear aluminum finish. The sides facing the natural area, uh, we have in a dark gray tone to kind of help it disappear uh, more from the public view. And I will say the public view occurs through several lines of trees. So if you try to see the site, uh, it does get obscured. And um, these are the elevations. Uh, top left is the front that faces north, that faces into the Cornell property, Fishel Band Center. The south faces towards Hoy Road. Um, and this does sit quite a bit higher than Hoy Road. Um, so a pedestrian there would have to look look up at an angle and you wouldn't even get a great view of the site from Hoy Road. Uh, the east is uh, facing the turnaround road uh, that you would access the site with. The west faces the egress side of Shultop. And I'll turn it back over to Leslie, talk a little more about the site. Thank you, Mike. So the project location, many folks on the phone, I assume are familiar with Shulkoff Stadium. This will be tucked in to the southern face of Shulkoff off of an access driveway. So pretty far off the public way as far as folks coming and enjoying a game, but pretty near for the team that needs to access the stadium for both their practice and competition. It's If folks are aware of the recent Dwyer Dam Bridge that we have just completed and reopened, there's a grand stair that travels north-south that many people use to come across campus. This will be just at the top and to the left of that stair across from the intersection of Dryden and Hoy. So this particular parcel, Mike, could you advance the slide, please? Thanks. This is part of one of Cornell's very large parcels. This is 154 acres. And so this parcel um, includes not just the project site, which you can see the shape of Shulkoff Crescent uh, to the bottom right of your screen, the largest facility. But if you'll advance the slide one more for me, Mike. Uh, you can see on the second bullet here, it also includes the engineering quad, law school, West Campus, portions of two UNAs, Cascadilla Creek is in there. It's quite encompassing. Live Slope is part of this. So it's one of our very large parcels, a lot going on there. We're basically talking about the athletics core of our campus where we have Shulkoff and where we're surrounded by Kite Hill Parking, which is for athletics and the other side of campus road is for athletics. So again, Project site is separated from the natural areas that are nearby by an already existing Shulkoff access driveway oh, uh, that comes around uh, to the back of the stadium. And that's used for egress, for setup, for emergency response, for all of those things. That separates uh, the space, which is a small flat area just off of Shulkoff from the basically wooded slope. That's um, you know, not one of our better natural areas, but connects into the broader UNA. Would you like me to go back two slides just to- Nope, that... we're good. This okay. is all zoned U1 zoning. So this is all institutional university zoning as are all of the lands that surround it. They're all Cornell owned and they're all U1 zoning. This complies and is consistent with that zoning. This will be for an institutional purpose, built single story building, all adjacent to athletics uses. And again, a small footprint, 0.3 acres. Next slide, please. couple of the site and landscape elements that we'll be bringing on. Um, as we bring this new structure onto campus, it will also have an ADA parking space. This is at the end of an existing driveway access path. So we have made it slightly larger to include room for one ADA space and turnaround and accessible aisle. Ties into an accessible path and a ramp from this ADA space into the structure and as well as ties into our newer existing egress path from Shulkoff Stadium out to the public right-of-way. And we, have, we are now including three new pedestrian light poles as part of this design. And there will be new landscape elements, including four new trees, nine new bushes. And we, are, we have uh, started to detail that landscape. Next slide, please. Here's the current concept for the site layout. So the Sprint Football 1800 or so square foot structure is uh, colored in red here, adjacent to parking just to the north and east that is accessed by an existing driveway. And the parking again is only for ADA. We are not driving extra parking up here. We have existing Kite Hill parking lot that's very nearby and convenient. This is merely for 
the purposes of getting folks that might have, um, if they're part of the team and maybe sprain an ankle, they can get up here and they can still participate in team activities. But again, you see the egress path just north of the structure. And this is in a, a green zone that's largely hidden away at the top left of your screen in very pale um, print. You'll notice it says Sholkoff Crescent. So there is a large wall right there. And we've been pretty mindful of the setbacks required in order to meet all code requirements. Next page, please. Lastly, our project timeline. Um, our goal would be, if possible, to come for a combined preliminary and final site plan in March or April. And then we're ready to move into a summer site prep. And again, the structure is modular, so it shows up. And once the site is prepared, it is placed on site. It's uh, built off site. And then we have sprint football, as usual, kicking off in the fall. Thank you. That's all we have this evening. Thank you. Um, so we'll just run around the room and give questions and comments. Um, Emily, could I start with you? Sure. Um, thank you for your always thorough presentations. Um, I like your use of materials. I think you did a really thoughtful choice to keep the red to the north and the east and you know that gripes blending into the trees. I think that's a smart decision. Um, my question for you would be, um, can we get a little more information about how the, the public right of way, if that, is that a street or just a path that's used um, that connects from the top of the stairs into the parking lot? And my question is really leading towards, you know, is this additional use and parking area going to affect pedestrians um, using the staircase? Otherwise, no questions. I think it's a great project and a, a good location for the use. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mitch. Yeah, this seems totally fine. I, you know, I don't really have any comments except that I have no idea what sprint football is. Maybe everybody else does. You didn't explain what it was. Oh, no. Can I answer that in one second? Sure. Okay. Sprint football is exactly the same as football, except there's a cutoff weight. So you have to weigh in before the game kind of like wrestling. So it's like football with a weight class. So if you are a very good high school football player, but you're just not massive and, you know, to be a, a college linebacker, you can still play varsity football. Nice. Garrick. Garrick. Oh, I think he's frozen. I'm sorry. Daniel. <laughs> Uh, no major comments. Uh, I appreciate the thoroughness for a project of this scale. Um, I think a lot of things are, uh, it lo looks good. Thank you very much. Uh, I will agree. I, I like the project. It seems fine. Your schedule seems probably achievable. I um, was curious about the expected life of this building. Uh, so certainly, um, Leslie, should I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> so we build things to last. Uh, this is a modular structure. We would expect it to last for 20 to 30 years, whether or not, uh, you know, what happens with our athletics program and the uses. We often reuse facilities over and over. Um, this will also offer that kind of opportunity if longer term, everything changes in that area. So a little more flexible than say our typical large academic building that's going to be here for a hundred years, right? Sure. Yeah. I see Garrick's back. Uh, did you have any questions or comments on this project? Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm sorry, I've gotten dropped. I don't know why I've gotten dropped from this call three times since the presentation started, but what I have seen of it looks fine uh, to me, no issues. Great. So I'm hearing a consensus from the board. I'm not hearing any particular areas of concern. Lisa, is there anything we should try to talk about before we declare ourselves lead agents and send folks home. All right. I see public that. hearing. We have a public hearing. We're scheduled for the public hearing. Yep. Okay. Oh. Wow. All right. Let, we'll do that. First, we'll declare ourselves lead agents for the project. Is there a motion to declare ourselves lead agents for this project? I see Emily move. Is there a second? Need a second. Mitch seconds. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Daniel, how do you vote? Yes. Emily, how do you vote? Yes. Mitch, how do you vote? Yes. Eric, how do you vote? 
Yes. Excellent. Um, so that does pass. With that, we do have a public hearing. Is there a motion to open public hearing? And we'll make a motion as long as we can keep it to 30 minutes. Mitch seconds. We'll keep it to 30 minutes. All those in favor of opening public hearing, just raise your hand. Public hearing is now open. Lisa and or Nikki, is there any member of the public wishing to speak? No, there is not. Okay. Is there a motion to close public hearing? Emily so moves. Is there a second? Daniel seconds. All those in favor of closing public hearing? Daniel? Oh, <laughs> public hearing is now closed. All right. That's, that's dispensed with. Um, and I think that is it for this project tonight. I do appreciate you guys having a thorough presentation and not a lot of time. That was super helpful. And we'll see you next month. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, everybody. All right. And that'll bring us to zoning appeals. So we do have one of the appellants here. Do you want them in there? Do you want Which them? project? For um, 304 Utica. Sure, we can have the appellant come in. That seems fine. So yeah. did you say what? that I can just turn off my uh, video and oh, right. myself? Is that okay? So uh, for the record, I'll be recusing myself because I am the architect for the next two projects for 304 Utica and 112 Fayette. All right. And we probably need uh, Elizabeth back too. We do need Elizabeth back. She's coming back, yeah. And I know that we had a link sent out, but could somebody bring up the information on the appeal in a screen sharey kind of way? Uh, let me see if I can find Hold it. on, I got the link. I'll get okay. it for you. Thanks, Anya. It's a big file. It's taking a moment for it to open. So give me one sec. So I can I can start reading it if you want to. All right. So this is um, an appeal for area variances um, in terms of lot width, lot coverage, front yard, side yard, and other side yard. Um, the applicant proposes to construct a new two-story addition on the rear of a single family home located at 304 Utica Street. The first floor addition will provide a new family room. The second level will include a bedroom and a bathroom. The addition will increase building footprint by 403 square feet, which will increase the lot coverage by to 38.5%. The R2B district permits a maximum lot coverage of 35%. In addition, the side yard to the south of the house is 8.75 feet of the required 10. The proposed project will create a second encroachment by relocating Bilco doors that extend into the required, required side yard by 6.75 feet. The property has existing deficiencies in lot width, front yard, and side yard that will not be exacerbated by the proposal. So existing house has front width, front yard, side yard, the, the, and the, the addition will um, is increasing lot coverage and the another side yard. Okay. So since we did just have this training about the different ways the planning board and the zoning board looks at things, I wonder if there's anything specific we want to say with respect to communicating to the zoning board on this. The normal things I would say would be Encouraging investment and existing ownership and no long-term planning impact. In fact, a positive planning impact along the lines of incurring, encouraging investments in places people already own and live. Um, 
but I'll say that I don't necessarily know how to rephrase or reframe things through the lens of, of that zoning training or what we think that might actually have an impact there. Lisa, if you had anything, I'd listen to you. Yeah, well, I think the training was really more about projects that are going through site plan approval and need variances. I mean, you can look at the, you know, I think you can, if if that is the way you feel about this, you can, those, those um, issues are, the, the, what you expressed is fine. Um, there was a comment about, uh, from a neighbor about, um, and I mean, you don't have to address that, but you could look at the size of the variance relative, you know, what, what are they asking for, you know? Sure. And I know that, that they look at the size of the variance, the BZA yeah. does, um, you know, and to me, those, those variances looked relatively minor, you know, we're, we're over lot coverage by something like 3%. We're over on one of the yards by something less than a foot. Um, you know, th those to me seemed minor impingements. I'm not sure that's the right word. Uh, when you contrast that with somebody, you know, able to grow their family and, and remain in their home in a home ownership way, which we're trying to encourage. Um, but I, I would hear from from other members of the board or if, if you know, any member of staff had anything to say about about that, I saw. I saw the comment. I, I didn't agree with the comment, um, but you know, we could. We could. We could. In, you know, if someone else agreed with that comment, we could include that or address it. I mean, the building is ten feet. Maintains the ten foot side yard. It's just a bilco door that doesn't. I mean, that's something. Oh yeah, yeah. It's super minor. When you're already encroaching the existing house, it looks like maybe more than that Bilco door does. Unless I'm misreading that drawing. Is there anything else we usually say for these type of homeowner expansion variance situations? I feel like there's some some rote stuff that we usually include that's just not coming to me. So it's usually um, no long-term planning impacts are identified. You often mention investment in properties. Um, sometimes um, a phrase that gets put in there is provided neighborhood concerns are addressed. But in this case, we know that there are neighbors who, I don't know how you want to deal with them. I mean, there are neighbors that think it's too big uh, and that said it doubled the size of the house. I think you can just look at the drawings and see that it doesn't double the size of the house. Um, I don't know. How do people on the board, does anybody feel differently about that neighbor comment? I think another comment that we usually say is, um, maintains the existing character of the neighborhood. Um, but this is really, setbacks is really on the zoning board. So yeah. we can just repeat what we always do, but it's really up to them. Yeah, I, I think that unless you're looking for additional language, that probably covers it. Uh, so the applicant or the appellant is here. Um, there's not necessarily a role for you guys to, to say much or do much here, but if there's there's something you wanted to say, we, we could listen for a little while. You're muted. Okay. Uh, no, I, it's fine. Uh, I, I recognize it's very late and you guys want to get along with your meeting. Uh, I'm happy to respond to the, the comment that you received or uh, we could just move things along if you're ready to vote. I think we can just move things along. We don't even vote. We did it. It happened. <laughs> it's advisory. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and then that brings us to the Fayette Street project.
Can you all read that okay? Yes. Yep. Emily's on fire. Once you get through reading it, let me know if you need me to navigate anywhere else. I don't normally drive this car, so. The drawing is usually helpful. I just wanted to know when everybody was done reading it yeah. and I'll go down there. Yeah, I I think you could probably go to the drawing. Everybody good? Okay. Page alterations should be in here somewhere. This is needs to be the existing. This seems to be the proposed. So they're removing the garage and adding the addition. Yeah. Well, I'm a neighbor and I like it, but I'm not sure that's helpful. Um, so things that leap out at me is that removing that garage is probably a net benefit especially if it's the garage i'm thinking of which is not in the best shape um and the stuff about homeowner investments uh and no long-term planning impacts i think still apply is there anything else members of the board would like to see included on this All right. Yeah, I think this is fine. So it's a shared driveway situation. Is that what's happening? And they park in the backyard. Oh, it works that way. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Even to go somewhere else. They're not taking down any trees. Nothing's happening there. This seems this seems all right. Unless anybody has anything else, I think we can move on. Um, and that brings us to old new business. Now. I will say I'm not excited to take on the the vice chair conversation without the whole board here. Uh, one I, thing I will say is somebody really wants it, they should say so. Um, otherwise, I'm going to try to stick CJ with it, uh, which I think is a reasonable way to go. But if somebody wants it, they should go for it because I think that would be ideal. Um. And then that brings us to reports. I, as chair, don't have a report except to say that it's late and I'm glad it went as well as it did. Uh, and I appreciate everybody helping it go well. Um, BPW liaison is not no longer with us uh, due to hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, is there a director's report? No, no. All right. I think that's it. Um, thanks, Daniel. You made it through your first uh, full meeting. How you feel? I, good. I certainly uh, hit the ground running. This was a long one, but, uh, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> good. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I saw Elizabeth move and Emily second. All those in favor. Have a good evening, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.